that members be patient as the chair proceeds, given the nature of conducting committee business virtually. This hearing is entitled Monetary Policy and the State of the Economy. I now recognize myself for four minutes uh, to give an opening statement. Welcome back, Chair Powell. Since your last testimony before this committee, the COVID-19 pandemic has continued to have a devastating impact all across the country. Over 500,000 people in the United States have lost their lives to the virus, and there have been, oh, 27.9 million U.S. cases of the virus. The economy continues to be in a crisis. Millions of families are struggling uh, to make rent or mortgage payments through no fault of their own. Roughly one third of small businesses remain closed and many more are at risk of permanently shutting their doors. I'm so glad that we now have President Biden providing leadership from the White House and a real plan to tackle this crisis once and for all. With Democrats now in control of the Senate, Congress can carry out that plan and provide the nation with the relief it so urgently needs. This committee has advanced legislation in our jurisdiction to implement President Biden's American Rescue Plan. And the full House will take up this legislation later this week after gross, if not criminal mismanagement of the crisis by the Trump administration. Americans have shown that they want competent leadership and decisive action to crush this virus and put the economy on the road to recovery. But even after Congress passes the American Rescue Plan, the country still needs the Federal Reserve to adapt and to stand ready to use all of its tools at its disposal to ensure an equitable and swift recovery. It is long overdue for the Fed to reconsider its normal operating procedures and use its authorities to tackle the racial wedge and employment gaps. The Fed must act vigilantly against ongoing signs of systemic stress, putting a stop to the deregulation that preceded this crisis. The Fed must continue to be attentive to inequality as it oversees this recovery. Taking the impact on consumers and small businesses into account when considering mergers in the financial industry. And uh, the Fed must proceed with greater alacrity regarding climate risk in its supervision of financial institutions. The Fed has recently taken a few steps in this regard, but much more is needed to combat the systemic and existential uh, treat. I look forward to your testimony and to discussing these matters today. I now recognize the ranking member of the committee, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, for five minutes. Chairman Powell, I'd like to commend you again for your swift response to the pandemic. The Federal Reserve was the fastest acting part of the federal response, thanks to your foresight and leadership. As we've discussed previously, Chair Powell, there is a clear distinction between what is fiscal policy and within the purview of Congress and what is monetary policy and within the purview of the Fed. I appreciate your work to protect the independence of the Fed, and I know that you'll continue to do so. We have politicians that are talking down our economy, even the Speaker of the House saying, quote, the economic crisis is accelerating, end quote. And they're saying this specifically to pass their spending package. Our economy is on the mend, despite what politicians parrot as their preferred narrative. The first phase of the storm is passing. Now we have to deal with the damage COVID wrought, and it did indeed uh, bring significant damage. And the virus, the shutdowns, schools not reopening, the lack of childcare, all have had serious consequences. These are maladies which the Fed cannot fix. In fact, Congress doesn't seem to have the power to do it either. It's governors and the states they lead who are showing the path forward. Money alone will not fix it. Vaccines, testing, treatment, and data-driven public health decisions will have a larger impact than either monetary policy or fiscal policy at this stage of the game. What's called for is targeted temporary relief directly related to COVID, not a typical 
Keynesian stimulus bill in the name of COVID relief. To be clear, we know there are many Americans still suffering. Behind every statistic is a family that is still reeling from this crisis. For a year now, we have been working to reach those in need. As you've said, Chairman Powell, this is a tale of two recoveries. Employment for the top quartile of wage earners has fallen by 4%, while the bottom quartile has dropped by a full 17%. So let's dig deeper here. More than 4 million Americans have been unemployed for almost a year. In the restaurant industry alone, one out of six businesses have been shuttered since last March. And while the CBO projects the unemployment rate, which currently stands at 6.2 percent, which, which, by the way, is lower than the unemployment rate under the first five and a half years of President Obama, uh, that unemployment rate uh, will continue to fall this year and to reach a pre-pandemic size of 2022 under the current uh, without any other additional fiscal action. There are millions of Americans fa of families juggling work, childcare, and paying and just praying that their schools will finally reopen. Yes, personal incomes have actually increased at the end of last year, and the personal savings rate stands at over 13%, a level not seen in four decades. Yet childcare costs have jumped by almost 50% since last year. A year ago, women outnumbered men in the workforce. And since the pandemic, 2.5 million women have left the workforce. Given the nature of the shutdowns, this temporary aid that we provided last year and the Fed's swift actions, they prevented the worst from po uh, possible outcomes from occurring in this crisis. Now we have to deal with the divide, the uneven recovery that has occurred. And as we exit this pandemic, we need to find innovative solutions that support finding employment for these Americans and bring those who exit the labor force completely. We need to bring them back in. And the Fed must also focus on regulatory flexibility and provide flexibility for, to financial markets to ensure that we have a, a less choppy recovery. And indeed, Chairman Powell, there are new challenges and choppy waters ahead. And I'm grateful for your steady hand and pragmatic leadership in the Federal Reserve and for our economy and for our government. Thanks so much, and I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the Chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, International Development, and Monetary Policy, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Times, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair and Chairman Powell. Thank you for being here today. And let me echo our thanks for your, incre your incredible intervention and work in uh, addressing the economic aspects of this pandemic. In 2008, the Federal Reserve took extraordinary actions, including the controversial, then controversial use of its emergency lending powers to rescue the financial sector. Uh, and the pandemic has shown us that the need for the Fed to engage in emergency intervention remains. When you were last testified before this committee in December, we discussed the wisdom or lack thereof of shutting down those emergency facilities before the pandemic was over. And then at the end of last year, we saw troubling signs on the horizon of elevated unemployment numbers and an uptick in business bankruptcy. So clearly we're not out of the woods. And if 2008 and 2020 have taught us anything, it is that crises happen and we need to prepare for them. Now, unlike in 2009, fiscal policy will be heavily deployed and our shoulder will be to the wheel. Uh, nonetheless, the Federal Reserve is arguably the major player in our capital market. So I look forward to hearing from you today, uh, uh, Chairman, not just on where we are, but how this ends. How does it unwind? A look at page 43 of your monetary report shows the incredible interventions. And the question is, how does this unwind and where do we go from here? With that, I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on National Security international development and monetary policy. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, for one minute. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to echo uh, my, the comments from my friend and Chairman, Chairman Himes of the subcommittee. We thank you, uh, Chairman Powell, for the extraordinary actions of the Board of Governors during 2020 in monetary policy and in the extraordinary facilities and using 13.3. And we also commend uh, the Congress and the executive branch in 2020 for their fiscal response, which gave us the resources we needed to fight the pandemic and get our economy to the point it is today to open. So I agree with Chairman Hines that now it's time to look on the other side of this pandemic. As we vaccinate America, as we get our businesses open, as we see state and local governments having far in excess of the tax revenues that they anticipated and people getting back to work, 
how do we safely open this economy, get those jobs available for those 10 million Americans still seeking employment? And I look forward to your testimony today. I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. I want to welcome to the committee our distinguished witness, Jerome Powell, Chair of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Chair Powell has served on the Board of Governors since 2012 and as its chair since 2017. Chair Powell has testified before this committee, and I believe he does not need any further introduction. So without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record. I want to remind members that Chair Powell has a hard stop and will be with us for three hours until 1 p.m. Eastern time. Chair Powell, you are now recognized to present your oral testimony. Thank you and good morning to all. Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and other members of the committee, I'm pleased to present the Federal Reserve's semi-annual monetary policy report. At the Federal Reserve, we are strongly committed to achieving the monetary policy goals that Congress has given us, maximum employment and price stability. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we've taken forceful actions to provide support and stability, to ensure that the recovery will be as strong as possible, and to limit lasting damage to households, businesses, and communities. Today, I will review the current economic situation before turning to monetary policy. The path of the economy continues to depend significantly on the course of the virus and the measures taken to control its spread. The resurgence in COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths in recent months is causing great hardship for millions of Americans and is weighing on economic activity and job creation. Following a sharp rebound in economic activity last summer, momentum slowed substantially with the weakness concentrated in the sectors most adversely affected by the resurgence of the virus. In recent weeks, the number of new cases and hospitalizations has been falling and ongoing vac vaccinations offer hope for a return to more normal conditions later this year. However, the economic recovery remains uneven and far from complete and the path ahead is highly uncertain. Household spending on services remains low, especially in sectors that typically require people to gather closely, including leisure and hospitality. In contrast, household spending on goods picked up encouragingly in January after moderating late last year. The housing sector has more than fully recovered from the downturn, while business investment and manufacturing production have also picked up. The overall recovery in economic activity since last spring is due in part to unprecedented fiscal and monetary policy actions, which have provided essential support to many households, businesses, and communities. As with overall economic activity, the pace of improvement in the labor market has slowed. Over the three months ending in January, employment rose at an average monthly rate of only 29,000. Continued progress in many industries has been tempered by significant losses in industries such as leisure and hospitality, where the resurgence in the virus and increased social distancing have weighed further on activity. The unemployment rate remained elevated at 6.3% in January, and participation in the labor market is notably below pre-pandemic levels. Although there has been much progress in the labor market since the spring, millions of Americans remain out of work. As discussed in the February Monetary Policy Report, the economic downturn has not fallen equally on all Americans, and those least able to shoulder the burden have been hardest hit. In partic particular, the high level of joblessness has been especially severe for lower wage workers and for African Americans, Hispanics, and other minority groups. The economic dislocation has upended many lives and created great uncertainty about the future. The pandemic has also left a significant imprint on inflation. Following large declines in the spring, consumer prices partially rebounded over the rest of last year. However, for some of the sectors that have been most adversely affected by the pandemic, prices remain particularly soft. Overall, on a 12-month basis, inflation remains below our 2% longer run objective. While we should not underestimate the challenges we currently face, developments point to an improved outlook for later this year. In particular, ongoing progress in vaccinations should help speed the return to normal activities. In the meantime, we should continue to follow the advice of health experts to observe social distancing measures and wear masks. I'll turn now to monetary policy. 
In the second half of last year, the Federal Open Market Committee completed our first ever public review of our monetary policy strategy, tools, and communication practices. We undertook this review because the U.S. economy has changed in ways that matter for monetary policy. The review's purpose was to identify improvements to our policy framework that could enhance our ability to achieve our maximum employment and price stability objectives. The review involved extensive outreach to a broad range of people and groups through a series of Fed Listens events. As described in the Monetary Policy Report, in August, the committee unanimously adopted its revised Statement on Longer Run Goals and Monetary Policy Strategy. Our revised statement shares many features with its predecessor. For example, we have not changed our 2% longer run inflation goal. However, we did make some key changes. Regarding our employment goal, we emphasize that maximum employment is a broad and inclusive goal. This change reflects our appreciation for the benefits of a strong labor market, particularly for low and moderate income communities. In addition, we state that our policy decisions will be informed by our assessments of shortfalls of employment <clears throat> from its maximum level, rather than by deviations from its maximum level. This change means that we will not tighten monetary policy solely in response to a strong labor market. Regarding our price stability goal, we state that we will seek to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. This means that following periods when inflation has been running below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. With this change, we aim to keep longer run inflation expectations well anchored at our 2% goal. Well anchored inflation expectations enhance our ability to meet both our employment and inflation goals, particularly in the current low interest rate environment in which our main policy tool is likely to be more frequently constrained by the lower bound. We have implemented our new framework by forcefully deploying our policy tools. As noted in our January policy statement, we expect that it will be appropriate to maintain the current accommodative target range of the federal funds rate until labor market conditions have reached level, levels consistent with the committee's assessments of maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. In addition, we will continue to increase our holdings of treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities, at least at their current pace, until substantial further progress has been made toward our goals. These purchases and the associated increase in the Federal Reserve's balance sheet have materially eased financial conditions and are providing substantial support to the economy. The economy is a long way from our employment and inflation goals, and it's likely to take some time for substantial further progress to be achieved. We will continue to clearly communicate our assessment of progress toward our goals well in advance of any change in the pace of purchases. Since the onset of the pandemic, the Federal Reserve has been taking actions to support more directly the flow of credit in the economy, deploying our emergency lending powers to an unprecedented extent, enabled in large part by financial backing and support from Congress and the Treasury. Although the CARES Act facilities are no longer open to new activity, our other facilities remain in place. Finally, we understand that our actions affect households, businesses, and communities across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We're committed to using our full range of tools to support the economy and to help ensure that the recovery from this difficult period will be as robust as possible. Thank you. I will look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman Powell. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. During our committee markup on February 10th, some members of our committee tried to suggest that further fiscal action was not needed because we are on a swift path to recovery. For example, it was noted that the unemployment rate in the United States is currently better than it had been for the first five years of the Obama administration. On that same day, you gave a speech that warned against this sort of top line assessment of employment, noting that, quote, Employment in January of this year was nearly 10 million below its February 2020 level, a greater shortfall than the worst of the Great Recession's aftermath, quote unquote. Chair Powell, do you believe our economy is in a healthier position right now than it was in 2014, several years into the recovery from the Great Recession? I 
I'm reluctant to make that uh, comparison without thinking about it further. I, I will just, though, echo that uh, we have 10 million fewer people working on payroll jobs than we had just one year ago today, and that uh, the unemployment rate, the reported rate, is 6.3%. But if you include people who were in the labor force and indeed working in February and a couple of other adjustments, you get to almost a 10% unemployment rate. So. There's a lot of slack in the labor market and, and a long way to go to, to maximum employment. Thank you. In that same February 10th speech, you mentioned that, and let me quote, fully recognizing the benefits of a strong labor market will take continued support from both near-term policy and longer run investments, quote unquote. Certainly, it will take a longer run investments uh, to achieve a true full employment economy that lifts workers' wages and finally closes the racial wealth gap. As Congress considered President Biden's American Rescue Plan, some of my colleagues have said we should, quote, wait and see, quote, unquote, before spending more. Chair Powell, does the economy need additional fiscal support from Congress right now? Also, how critical is it for Congress to make longer run investments if we want to eliminate the racial wealth gap. What, what I was really saying, Matt, Madam Chair, uh, with that was that we've shown that we can, over the course of a long expansion, we can get to low levels of unemployment and that the benefits to society, including particularly to lower moderate, in, moderate income people, are very substantial. We've shown that we can do that. But it's not really a great strategy to wait until the eighth or ninth year of an expansion to get those benefits to, to really um, improve through the cycle. What I was saying in that set of remarks was that uh, it'll take the private sector and it'll take investments in, from the public sector in, in, you know, frankly, in the workforce, education, training, policies that support workforce participation, things like that. That's what I was, that's what I was really getting at there. Response. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, yield back my time and I'm going to call on the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. McHenry, who is the ranking member of the committee. Uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and and uh, in fact, I, I, I think your uh, workforce speech uh, was your labor market speech was a very important one for all of us to take note of. Um, and this recovery is different than the uh, recovery from the financial crisis. Um, it took much longer for us to get to this rate of uh, unemployment uh, than it did uh, post financial crisis. And as I mentioned in my statement uh, that the, the chairman of the committee was uh, kind enough to quote from is that the labor market uh, now is better than it was in President Obama's first term of office. So these these recoveries are different. Now, also, you had a broad-based recovery um, that took decade, uh, almost a decade to, to come about uh, it, with uh, post-financial crisis. Um, but right now, you have segments of the economy, like you mentioned in your statement, Chair Powell, about hospitality. Uh, that that is uh, lagging because of state shutdowns. Uh, but in your in your testimony, you mentioned the Fed's exit strategy is contingent on meeting the Fed's goals goals for economic recovery. So, how close is the economy to meeting the Fed's uh, goals, and what does that look like? So, um, what we've said uh, is that we would be purchasing assets at least at the current pace. Uh, until we see substantial further progress toward our goals. So that's actual progress. That's not forecast progress. So we would want to see that we moved, you know, it, it is what it, what it sounds like. We, we would like to see incoming actual data that show us moving closer to our goals, goals both for inflation and for employment. And that's what it'll take. And I agree there's an element of judgment in that, but, but we will be communicating as clearly as possible and as far in advance as possible how we perceive the, 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 the path of progress toward those goals. Okay, also, consistent with your, your mandate, which, consistent yeah, with the mandate. Very much um, so. So what, what does the labor market look like uh, when, when the Fed has achieved this goal? What does, that, what does the labor market look like? 
That's so. I think it's easier to say with liftoff. We, we've been very specific with liftoff. We, we we said in liftoff we'd need to see labor market conditions that are consistent with maximum employment, inflation at two percent, and inflation expected to move moderately above two percent for some time. That's those are the conditions for liftoff, and they're quite specific. We haven't tried to be okay. specific about the about uh, you know the the pace of asset purchases, and and uh, we've just said. Uh, uh, substantial further progress is what we said. Okay. So, Chair Powell, yesterday you also spoke about the digital dollar being a high priority for the Fed. I think this is a national security issue, an economic security issue for sure. You said you're committed to transparency as you look into the digital dollar. I think that's important. I think that's very important for our system of government. Uh, I think it's a very uh, important thing for an open society. But let's get into a few specifics on that if we can. Uh, what can the public expect in terms of learning the details of this project going forward? And are some uh, some more details, uh, are you able to share with us today uh, what we can expect from the Fed in this year, uh, over the, the course of this year uh, with the digital dollar project? Yeah, so this is going to be an important year, and this is gonna, going to be the year in which we uh, engage with the public pretty actively, including with some public events that we're working on, at, at which I'm not going to announce today, but there are things that we're working on. And it, it's the sense of this is not, here are the decisions we've made, what do you guys think? It's going to be, <clears throat> these are the trade-offs, these are the, they're both policy questions and there are technical questions that interrelate between those two, and they're, they're very uh, challenging questions. And, and so we, we're going to want to have a public dialogue about that with all of the interested constituencies. And, and that, is, that is the idea of what we're doing. In the meantime, we're working on the technical challenges and also collaborating with and, and sharing work with the other central banks around the world who are doing this. And you know, we will need, um, it, depending on what we do, we could well need uh, legislative authorization for such a thing. That, that hasn't, uh, isn't clear until we, until we see which way we're going. But so we will be engaging significantly with, with you and your colleagues on Capitol Hill as well. Okay. So, I, I think the project's vital. I think it's vital for American competitiveness. Um, but I also, there, there's a fear that some want to use the digital dollars way to kill private sector innovation um, and in our banking system, um, implementing modern monetary policy, uh, modern monetary theory, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Fed accounts. What do you say to folks hoping to exploit the digital dollar project in, in that way? Well, I, one thing we need to be very mindful about is that we have a functioning financial system and a banking system uh, and capital markets, which intermediate between savers and borrowers, and they're the best markets and I would say the strongest banks in the world. We need to be careful with our design of the digital dollar that we don't uh, create uh, something that will undermine that, that, that very healthy market-based function. Uh, that's one thing okay. for sure. Yeah. Now, final final question here. You mentioned the labor market. We talked about the labor markets. Uh, is, as far as uh, the fiscal side of the house, what are what are the things that we should be doing? What are the biggest challenges to getting people back to work? Well, the single biggest, as you well know, unemployment and low activity is concentrated in that reasonably broad sector of the economy in the service sector where people gather closely together. Uh, travel and entertainment, leisure, that, that whole, hotels, th those sorts of things. The single most important policy to getting those sectors reopened and getting people back to work, of course, it, of course is bringing the pandemic to a decisive end as soon as possible. And we, we're, you know, we, we're on the path to that, but we haven't done it yet. So I think it's important that we, that we do quite decisively this year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you for your leadership. Velasquez. Who is also Thank the you. committee on small business is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Chairwoman. Uh, Chairman Powell, I heard you speak about the changes in the FOMC's monetary policy framework in your opening statement. It is clear that the pandemic has had an outside impact on women, minorities, and younger workers. How will the changes in the FOMC's monetary policy framework benefit workers in these groups. So what we what we learned in the course of the last expansion was that we could have an unemployment 
at uh, historically low levels without seeing troubling inflation arise. So we, we took that on board in creating our new uh, uh, framework. And as I mentioned in my remarks, that means that we won't tighten uh, uh, monetary policy just because of a strong labor market. We want to see either uh, inflation moving up in a troubling way or other risks to, to the achievement of our goals. And that, that puts us in a place where we can um, have low levels of unemployment again. And when we get to those low levels, we see that, that they do benefit low and moderate income communities and women and minorities more uh, than others who tend to benefit earlier in the expansion. So that plus what we said about um, uh, uh, maximum employment being a broad and inclusive goal, I think I, think I would point to. Very good, thank you. Uh, Chairman Powell, in May 2020, the OCC finalized a rule substantially revising the Community Reinvestment Act, which the Fed and the FDIC did not sign onto. In September 2020, the Fed proposed its own update to the CRA. With the change in the administration, do you expect the Fed to re-engage with the OCC and the FDIC on CRA rulemaking? And do you think there is an opportunity for a harmonized rule amongst all three agencies? I think there is an opportunity for a harmonized role among the three agencies, and I uh, we are engaged, um, have been engaged, and continue to be engaged with with the FDIC and the OCC, and we're working on that very thing. Do you have a timeline? I think we're just getting started. Uh, okay. Uh, there will be a new comptroller, but nonetheless, we're we're working on it. And by the way, it will be one that has broad support among the community of intended beneficiaries, which was always the Fed's test and my test for what it would take for the Fed to support reform of CRA. Glad to hear that, especially at this time when underserved communities, minority and female uh, businesses and uh, all that have been impacted by this pandemic and CRA is a way uh, to lift up communities of color, particularly. Chairman Powell, last week, Governor Brainard gave a speech on the role of financial institutions in tackling the climate challenge. In her speech, she stated, and I quote, climate change is already imposing substantial economic costs on the economy and is projected to have a profound effect on the economy at home and abroad. Would you agree with her statement and can you give some examples of how you see that to be true? Well, I think climate uh, change is a very important issue. And if you'll allow me, I, I, I will start by saying that uh, the nation's policy on climate change really needs to be set in the first instance, instance by you, elected representatives in the House and Senate, and then by the administration through the agencies that Congress has created. Our role is really that of assuring that we are using our powers to carry out our mandate in supervising financial institutions to make sure that they're resilient to all risk, including that of climate change. That's what we're doing. And can you explain the steps uh, the Fed will be taking over the next 18 to 24 months to ensure the financial system can deal with the future financial and economic risks posed by climate change? Yes, so we're doing right now a great deal of outreach and research and uh, consultation. And by the way, the, the larger and medium sized banks are doing the same thing. It is really time to have this, uh, to do this work and to try to understand it's, climate change is a, long, a longer run uh, issue to deal with. And you will see that the financial institutions themselves are very focused on understanding how it will over time affect their business model. We're doing, we're looking at the same thing from the standpoint of a regulator and supervisor. So research and basic work to lay out a framework, which will take some time, but, but it is time for us to do that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Missouri, Mrs. Wagner, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Chairman Powell. It's good to see you again. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for all that you and the Fed have done during this um, unprecedented pandemic. Under the, under the Fed's average inflation targeting, you are looking for inflation to be, and I quote, 
moderately above 2% for some time to make up for undershooting inflation in the past. What does moderately above 2% for some time mean specifically? And why do we believe this is achievable if the FOMC's three-year projections for quite some time now um, have been forecasting inflation, in fact, of 2% or less? So on the first part, what does moderately mean? We, we don't have a formula and we're not going to have a formula. Um, the, the sense of it though, is that we want inflation to average 2% over time. And the reason we want that is that we want inflation expectations to be anchored right at 2% and not somewhat below 2%, which is arguably the case now. That's really how we're looking at it. Um, in terms of, can we get there? Um, I'm confident that we can and that we will, and we are committed to using our tools to achieving that. Um, the, the three year time frame is actually an arbit an arbitrary three year time frame chosen by us. Uh, and I, I, you know, we're just being honest about about the challenge. We live in a, in a, in a time where there are significant disinflationary pressures around the world and where essentially all uh, major advanced economy central banks have struggled to get to 2%. Um, we believe we can do it, believe we will do it. It, it may take more than three years, but you know, we'll update that every quarter. We update that assessment and we'll see, uh, we'll see how that goes. Thank you, Chairman Powell. I, I know you were asked uh, a number of times by my colleagues in the Senate yesterday, uh, whether the Fed intends to uh, extend the exclusion of low risk assets, such as uh, treasuries and reserve balances from the supplementary leverage ratio. I strongly supported the agency's decision nearly a year ago uh, to make this exclusion in recognition, I think, of the fact that banks were receiving just an unprecedented amount of new deposits, largely as a, a result of the Fed's actions uh, that continue, continue to put pressure on leverage ratios. Uh, you indicated, sir, yesterday that the Fed is still considering considering whether or not to provide an extension. Do you agree that the exclusion proved to be an important tool to preserve liquidity in the treasury market? Yes, I, I do agree to that. I, but I mean, we, we're now, we're just looking at this. I don't really have anything for you on that decision, but I, I didn't have anything yesterday as you pointed out. Uh, so we're looking at that and we know we know when the deadline is and we're we're working on that and we'll come forth with something you know, relatively soon. Well, I hope it's 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 relatively uh, soon, uh, Mr. Chairman, because given that we're still considering uh, new stimulus and and other accommodations to continue economic recovery, um, I'm I'm concerned and I'm wondering if, if you are concerned about that that arbitrarily removing the exclusion on March 31 could put additional pressure on the the, the treasury um, market. I mean, making sure that um, the SLR is is um, is extended, I think, is is very very important as we continue uh, this recovery. And as I said, as as further stimulus actions are um, um, are considered and put into uh, into law. March 31 is nearly upon us, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it is. Oh, come on. Surely you can uh, talk to us a little bit more about, about how important that was over the past year in terms of our, our banking industry and, um, and to keep liquidity in, in the market, given the large number of deposits uh, that were extended to our banking community. I'm just going to say that we're having discussions on it right now and, and internally here, and I, I really don't want to go any further than that. I'm sorry, but it, it, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're making a decision, we're considering it, and, and when we have a decision, we'll, we'll come forward. I'm sorry. I, I, I respect that, and um, I look forward to that decision, and uh, Madam Chairman, I, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman from California, <clears throat> Mr. Sherman, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on investor protection 
Entrepreneurship and Capital Markets is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I'm good to, it's good to hear about your Fed Listens events, but I assure you your best Fed Listens event is right here today. You will not find 50 people in better touch and more representative of the 320 million Americans. I've grown old serving on this committee and I've seen your predecessors, predecessors, predecessor come here and Republicans attack them for what they regarded as a too expansionary monetary policy, whether the expansionary system be the traditional or the uh, relatively newfangled quantitative easing. Uh, it's good for me to live long enough to see that uh, many of the Republicans are moving in our direction uh, toward the need for a somewhat more expansionary monetary policy. And I would hope that you would be looking at two and a quarter percent rather than 2% as your target. Uh, I also commend you for the quantitative easing. It has allowed you to remit to the federal government 50 to $100 billion in each of the last several years. And so those who criticize your big balance sheet have been unwilling to identify which taxes they would raise in order to make up for that lost revenue. Also, your quantitative easing big balance sheet approach is the only tool you have to influence long-term interest rates, which I think are much more important to our economy, since it, you have to borrow long-term to build a factory or build a business. Uh, and I prefer monetary policy to an expansionary fiscal policy because we, all of your tools reduce the federal deficit and all of our tools increase the, uh, uh, the, the long-term federal debt. I wanna focus your attention on LIBOR uh, it now appears as if the LIBOR index will continue to be published till June of 2023. Uh, uh, it's almost disappointing to get a reprieve and that it will reduce the pressure on us to actually solve this problem, but it does give us more time. And uh, uh, there is, of course, the Alternative Reference uh, Rates Committee, ARC, uh, and we have legislation to facilitate uh, how to deal with what will be $2 trillion of existing contracts that don't have backup language. Um, I wonder if you can confirm for me, uh, it, in your view, is it necessary to have federal legislation to have a smooth transition after uh, June 2023 when LIBOR is no longer public? Yes, we think it will be. Um, as you know, many LIBOR contracts are going to run off before then, but there'll be a hard tail, as we say, and, and we do think federal legislation is, uh, is the best answer. And there are those who think that we can, that the private sector can just invent a synthetic LIBOR and that would solve the problem. Is that as good a solution as federal legislation? No, the federal legislation with creating a, a path for a backup would be, would be the, the best solution, we think. Thank you. Um, now I want to move to something uh, that we've talked about before and that it's some will regard as a, mod a, a small issue, uh, and that is the uh, uh, system for avoiding wire fraud. When we've talked about this uh, earlier this month, where uh, people, usually somebody trying to buy a home the first time ever when they'll uh, remit ten, twenty, thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for the down payment. It's their life savings. And they're tricked into wiring the money to the wrong account number and they lose it forever. Now you're developing uh, the new FAT Fed Now system, and your bureaucrats have told us uh, that they don't want to engineer that system to avoid this tragedy that occurred, as I said, affecting $150 million uh, just last year. Uh, that they don't want to do the really simple thing of just saying that when you remit money, you identify not only the account number you're sending it to, but the name of the person you're sending it to. And uh, I know your bureaucrats will tell you they don't want to do it. I wonder whether you'll go back to your agency and get personally involved and push them to avoid this tragedy. Uh, I don't think your successor should have to, um, oh, well, these people at the next Fed listen session, maybe 10 years from now, who have lost their homes as a result of this. Can you commit to getting personally involved in having a system that will hopefully protect homeowners or home buyers? So 
Um, I think, as you know, we, we've looked carefully at this and concluded that pay matching is not the, the best way to do it. And, and there are just problems in the U.S. system, but we have other ways to do it. Well, I, I'd be happy to go back and, and revisit that, though. If, you, if there's another way, let me know what it is, because your, uh, uh, your, your staff just tells me they don't want to. The I gentleman's to. time has expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lucas, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Chairman Powell, you know I have a tendency to focus on those things that uh, affect my people back home up and down Main Street and across the 3rd District of Oklahoma. So let's discuss for a moment. When you were last before the committee in June, you noted that the U.S. banking system has been a source of strength during the pandemic. The Fed's monetary policy report released on February 19 reaffirmed this point, uh, stating that institutions at the core of the financial services system remain resilient. Do you continue to believe that banks are a source of strength? And we elaborate both on what that means for the economy and for banks' abilities to lend, yes, absorb losses potentially too, and provide liquidity in distressed markets. Yeah, so uh, we've, um, as you know, we spent, uh, and the bank spent 10 years uh, in a strengthening process, higher capital, better risk management, higher liquidity, all of those things. And, uh, and then we received a world historical sized shock in the form of the pandemic. And um, I think, you know, essentially close to a year into it, almost exactly a year into it, uh, uh, we see so far, what we see is uh, that uh, our banks have, uh, have held up quite well. And um, their capital, the big banks, capital has actually increased over the course of the last year. While they've also taken 100 billion plus uh, worth of reserves against losses, and so they are able to keep lending. Um, they're not a source of weakness. At the beginning of the pandemic, they were very important because they did absorb that huge flow of deposits, and they made all of those loans as companies pulled down their lines of credit. Now those were paid back early on, but at the very beginning, when it mattered a lot, they were a source of strength. So I think all of that is right. Um, it's, it's, uh, we've always got to continue to be vigilant, vigilant on, on those things, but a first draft of history is that, is that the banks are strong. And I would say the same for small and medium sized banks as well have generally held up. Well, there are going to be issues. And as we come out of this, there, there are going to be businesses that fail and there will be losses, but, um, it's quite different, a very, very different situation than we had after the global financial crisis. Absolutely. Yeah. And Mr. Chairman, let's discuss for a moment a topic that's very important, not only to me, but my friends in the majority on the Financial Services Committee. The national unbanked rate has been falling steadily for the past decade. And since the last calculated in 2019 sets at about 5.4%. Still, this represents more than 7 million U.S. households without a checking or savings account. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic is likely to contribute to an increase in the rate of unbanked households. Chairman, what would you suggest to reduce the adverse impact on the unbanked and underbanked in the aftermath of the pandemic to ensure that no one is left out of the economic recovery? I, you know, I think those are, those are, it's a serious problem to address. Um, you know, we, we tend to address it through uh, our uh, community affairs and um, uh, efforts to make sure to, you know, fair lending policies and things like that. I also think uh, that there's more that Congress can do, I'm sure, to to assure that people have, you know, education around around uh, uh, financial matters. And um, it, the other piece of it is you know, they're just they're people at the lower end of the income spectrum who are living hand to mouth. We need a strong recovery. We need uh, continued support for monetary policy, and, and we'll be providing that as well. One last question, question, Chairman, and, and it impacts the ability of every Main Street to function. According to FDA, the United States administered more than 63 million doses of COVID vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, Chairman Powell, can you expand on how important to the economic recovery or how dependent the recovery is on ramping up that manufacturing and distribution? Yes, this is the, the weakness we see in our economy now is is uh, unusually concentrated in a set of industries that involve people getting really close together. 
hotels, restaurants, travel, entertainment, all of those places. And that's millions of people who aren't working and, and businesses that, that may have been in business for generations going out of businesses. It's a, that, that's what that is. And, and the way to get after that is through uh, by, by successfully, decisively bringing the pandemic to an end. Uh, as soon as possible. That that's the single best growth and economic and prosperity uh, creating measure that any of us can can undertake. And that you know that is the vaccination. It's continuing to observe social distancing and wearing masks. Uh, and um, hopefully we're on that road now. And, and you know if we are, we're going to see uh, you know uh, uh, there's, there's grounds for optimism in the second half of the year for the economy. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on oversight and investigations, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I thank uh, the witness for appearing. I'm always honored to, to uh, have him here before the committee. My question has to do with the State Small Business Credit Initiative. Uh, this is an initiative that was started under a Republican administration. It has served us exceedingly well. And the chairwoman uh, with her uh, insight and foresight has expanded this program to make sure that it covers women and people of color to a greater extent. Uh, we are talking about having this initiative be funded with $10 billion. And this is in the uh, COVID package. And this $10 billion can drive up to $100 billion of private sector investments in these small businesses. States would be required to submit a plan as well as other jurisdictions on how expeditiously these funds can be delivered to help small businesses respond to and recover from the pandemic. A plan to encourage participation of MDIs, Minority Depository Institutions, as well as CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, would also be a part of this. Mr. Chairman, my question to you is simply this. How important is it that small businesses receive these capital investments? They sometimes find it exceedingly difficult to acquire funds of this type, the type that we have in this package. Uh, how important is it that these funds during this pandemic get to these small businesses? Well, uh, small businesses are under a lot of pressure uh, in this um, at, at the current time more so than many of the larger businesses that had resources to get through this. I would say MDFI, MDIs and CDFIs are, are very important channels for reaching them. Um, I'm, uh, it's not appropriate for me to take a position on this particular uh, provision uh, and its inclusion in, the, um, in, in legislation, but uh, I would just say that it is important for small businesses and, and you mentioned MDIs and CDFIs. We, as you know, we work very closely with those organizations and, and think highly of the contribution they make to our economy. Yes, sir, and I, I concur with what you said about working closely with them. I, I happen to be aware of some of your good works. Um, the uh, community banks, uh, as you know, I'm very much concerned about them, and uh, some of them are on the margin. And this type of assistance to some of these uh, smaller banks can be of great uh, help to them. I don't want you to comment on a spe specific bank or specific banks in general, but I am concerned about the need to maintain these institutions that have a niche. Uh, they have a clientele that somehow and sometimes will not be met. Uh, their needs won't be met if they don't have these institutions that are in the communities. Ha have you found that it's, it's good to have these institutions in these communities where uh, the need is not always met? Yes, I mean, we, we think community banks are, are a very important part of the fabric of our society, and uh, we see them under longer term secular pressures. They've been declining, and uh, we don't want to do anything that, that adds to that through regulatory burden. And actually, we've got a subcommittee. We have a, a community banker on the, on the Board of Governors. Uh, and we, we, we try to do everything we can to, to not be part of the problem because, you know, people are leaving small towns and moving to cities and, and things like that. And that is putting pressure on rural community banks. But um, overall, they, they know their communities and, and uh, we want them to operate safely and soundly and successfully in their communities. 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, very little time left. So what I would like to do is simply uh, acknowledge the chairwoman for helping us to get this uh, $10 billion into the COVID package. Uh, Ms. Beatty also helped us to modify it along with uh, one of my Republican colleagues so that the very small businesses will get some help. Uh, there are small businesses and then there are very small businesses and we don't wanna leave any of them behind. So Madam Chair, uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity to ask these questions and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much and I appreciate your comments. Uh, I will now recognize a gentleman from Florida, Mr. Posey, uh, for five minutes. Well, thank you uh, very much, Madam Chairwoman. I'm pleased that we have this opportunity to hear Chairman Powell's semi-annual report on the state of monetary policy. Um, we've all shared quite a year since February 2020 hearing when the virus was just breaking over the horizon. And we continue to be motivated and preoccupied with the horrendous, unprecedented event. Uh, through no fault of their own, our constituent families and their small businesses experienced perhaps the worst economic downturn in our history and theirs. Uh, it was absolutely right to address the suffering of our workers and their families, and we can be proud of the bipartisan response uh, in the public laws we passed, such as the CARES Act. We are now in a period of somewhat less consensus about the next thing to do. On the one hand, uh, the administration and others are saying that we need to uh, go big on spending, and, and this week the House is slated to vote on their $1.9 trillion big plan. Uh, notably, the big plan uh, spends money with a wide scope, and of course the money uh, will likely all need to be borrowed. Others are saying that in many sectors, the economy is doing well, but that in other sectors like hotels, restaurants, and tourism, uh, workers and businesses are still suffering. Now, thus, many people say that uh, the targeted relief will be a better approach and save us borrowing to the tune of $1.9 trillion. And I associate myself with the, with the targeted approach, by the way. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering, uh, you've been urging that monetary policy can't fully restore the economy, and you've made that clear today, and that fiscal policy must play an essential role. Uh, just after the Federal Markets Open Committee meeting on January 29th of 2020, you said, uh, quote, the labor market continues to perform well. The labor market continues to be strong. We see strong job creation. We see low unemployment. Very importantly, we see labor force participation continuing to move up, end of quote. Uh, fiscal policy includes taxes as well as spending. Uh, things look really good in January of 2020. Uh, in fact, far better than say four years earlier. Uh, given your knowledge of fiscal policy, did Fed research suggest that the reduction of personal taxes and, and corporate tax and reductions in regulation work to reduce unemployment to historic lows, uh, generally and among many diverse groups? Oh, I, I'm not able to get the answer here. Uh, the longest expansion in our recorded history actually began in 2009 and ended last year, as you point out, with the arrival of the pandemic. The labor market improved steadily uh, 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 and that gathered strength. Actually, the peak job creation year in that expansion was 2015. We did reach low levels of unemployment, and that includes particularly for minorities. And there was uh, just a whole lot to like about where the labor market was last year. I'll just say that many, many factors contributed to that long expansion, and I, I, I don't know any way to unscramble the omelet on that. Well, thank you. Uh, what does the Current effectiveness of the fiscal policy of low income and corporate taxes and a policy of constrained regulation that started in 2017 teach us about the potential effects of increasing taxes and regulation as we try to recover from the pandemic. Um, it's not for me to comment on uh, on fiscal policy. I am, uh, you know, we have a specific role and specific tools and uh, I'm going to stick to that. So, so 
<clears throat> you don't have any opinion of, of uh, uh, what lower uh, taxes and less regulations do to help an economy recover from the pandemic? I think those are exactly the questions for elected officials. Those are right over this over over home plate for you. That's that's you know we do we are we you've given us a, a specific job maximum employment and price stability. We use our tools and we don't get involved in in what are political judgments uh, around fiscal policy. That's that's really for you and the administration. All right, I I, I just thought it was uh, something that every person would have some opinion on uh, one way or the other. I see my time has expired, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on housing, community development, and insurance, is now recognized for five minutes. We'll move on. If he is not uh, available, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Cleaver. With also the uh, protection and financial institutions has been recognized for benefit. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Chairman, thanks for being here. Thanks for your service, especially during this last year. So I'm going to ask you sort of four different areas. First is going to be on that supplemental uh, leverage ratio and see if you if I can get an answer out of you that Miss Wagner didn't. Second will be on state and local governments and uh, support for them. Third will be on bubbles that you may see existing. And the fourth will be on credit cards. So hopefully I can get to all of these. Um, last year in April, uh, the Federal Reserve, the FDIC eased capital requirements for financial institutions by allowing firms to exclude treasuries, US treasuries and deposits held at the Federal Reserve from the Supplementary Leverage Ratio, the SLR. Uh, this was a welcome policy, which helped stabilize the Treasury's market and gave flexibility to financial institutions in a time of uncertainty. And I know with respect to your answers to Ms. Wagner, as well as to the Senate, um, you know, you all are sort of deciding what you want to do in that area, but I'm gonna ask you a more general question. Uh, if regulators do not extend the SLR relief, do you think the additional capital requirements will have a meaningful effect on the bank's ability to lend into the recovery? So I'm just going to say again, you know, if, if I start answering these questions and get pulled down that slope, you know where I'm going to wind up. So uh, I, I really that's something that's under consideration right now. and I'm just going to have to leave it at that. All right, so let's take the flip side, see if I can get you to answer this. I know that a number of institutions are interested in uh, expanding uh, their dividend program. Are you, is the Federal Reserve considering allowing uh, banks to offer more dividends? So we, we don't have a decision on that. That's another thing that we will be looking at as well. You know, we, what's been happening is uh, we've been restricting banks from share of purchases and dividends and as a result of that they've actually built capital and as time goes on we'll be we'll be looking at that on a quarter by quarter basis and uh, that's coming up but it's not uh, not today's decision well i i know miss wagner is going to feel good that you didn't answer either one of us so i appreciate that and uh, i'm sure she does too let's turn to state and local governments and um on pages 24 and 25 of uh, your report, and it's uh, graphs 27 and 28, there appears to be a precipitous drop off in revenues and taxes collected and employment uh, at the state and local government uh, levels. Um, do you, in, in the legislation that we're considering, uh, there is substantial assistance to state and local governments. Is this one of the areas of the economy that the, the Fed has been concerned about? Well, we, we were quite concerned at the beginning because of the example of the global financial crisis where weak uh, revenues uh, led to um, really weight on the recovery through some years. Um, I'm not gonna comment directly on whether you, on, on, on the, the, the proposal that's under consideration right now, right in front of you this week. You know, so what, what we see is that 
uh, revenues have performed better than expected. They're, they're about flat overall. Some states, they're down a lot. Other states, they're actually up. Uh, so we, could, we have a good picture of revenues. We have a picture of employment, and employment is down 1.3 million or so. A lot of that's education, which means people who work in schools, and, and that should be addressed by, by the reopening of the schools. The thing we don't have a great picture of, and you may, may be able to get it, is, uh, is more the expenses. What are the one-time COVID-related expenses? So it's a complicated picture, and there's differences between across the states. States have very different uh, uh, positions on this. So, and, and I would, uh, I, I know it's a, it's a question you're considering, and I'm sure your your experts are focused on all. Well, in Colorado, and looking at your report, I mean, obviously, my state has a lot of leisure industry, tourism, and energy production, and it's hit us uh, particularly hard uh, in terms of employment and revenues. So last question. Do you see any bubbles that are of concern to you, whether it's stock valuations or real estate? Because on page 30, and I know my time is about to expire, um, you say that uh, you see real estate prices have uh, are at all-time highs, but vacancy rates are at all, some all-time highs as well. Uh, so your time is actually up according to my clock, but will I, will I have time to answer this, uh, Madam Chair? Go ahead and answer. Okay, so I just, I, I, I can't answer that in 10 seconds, right? So we, we have a broad framework for financial stability, one of which, one of the four pillars of which is asset prices. And there are some asset prices that are elevated by some measures, yes. Uh, other aspects of, of the financial stability framework, uh, leverage in the financial system is moderate. Uh, funding risk is, is moderate. Uh, I would say leveraging the non-financial system uh, has gone up a bit because of the pandemic. All right, we, very mixed picture. All right, I thank you for your answers. I thank for the chair for extra time. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Lukemeyer, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome, uh, Chairman Powell. Great to see you again, and uh, thank you for your great leadership during the pandemic and this past year. It's been a trying time for all of us, and. I think you've done a good job of uh, steering the Fed through this uh, storm, as the ranking member uh, talked about it a while ago. <clears throat> um, one of the things that's concerning to me is uh, I saw an article in a recent paper here with regards to the greening of the banking system. And I think my good friend, uh, Congressman Barr, of Kentucky, and I, uh, he, uh, he headlined a letter to uh, the Fed, and I was one of other 45 members who signed on to it with regards to um, the feds, including uh, uh, climate stuff into their stress tests. And while I understand the need for that to an extent, uh, it certainly is concerning um, the racism and flags for me um, from the standpoint that <clears throat> uh, in an article here it was talking, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a gentleman by the name of Ike Brannon, who's an economist and president of Capital Policy Analytics. He was talking about the stress test and he said that, um, you know, it's a long term goal of many who advocated that the Fed take this step. But he think they, but he says, I think they have designs that go beyond climate change, creating a system whereby the government can use its financial regulatory power to direct the economy away from businesses and industries it disapproves of is very much a goal of many Democrats in Congress and administration. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, that sounds an awful like like choke point to me. Operation Choke Point was something that we put the dagger in the heart of a while, uh, several years ago. And to resurrect that, to use climate change as an excuse to go after businesses uh, who are doing legal business in a legal way, produ producing products and services we need as an economy is wrong. And I'm just wondering where you stand on that. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. Sorry. Uh, first, let me say that the, the climate stress scenarios are are completely different from the stress tests. It's not the same thing at all. And if you, but you really you really asked about a, a, a different question. Sorry, which was um, uh, oh yeah. Uh, what, what, give just in two seconds. What was the question you did ask? Well, basically, it's about whether you're weaponizing the regulatory right. to do web choke point stuff again. If on business, on, on bankings, on banks that do not necessarily comply with what your climate agenda may be. So that's, so we, we don't make, we're not climate policy makers. That's, those are 
climate policymakers are democratically elected people and those they delegate that authority to. So we, um, we're not thinking of it that way. We, as you know, as an institution, we've had a long held uh, reluctance, resistance, um, and unwillingness really to engage in the allocation of credit. We think that is for the private sector. And if Congress wants to allocate credit to, in particular ways, that's fine. We don't, we don't want to get involved in that. And, and it's not something we're looking to do. What we're doing is with, well, go ahead. I'll let you go. Well, I, I would just make the point that we found during the Obama administration that Operation Choke Point was alive and well. It was instituted by them. It was carried out by them. And we tried to get rid of it during the, the previous this past administration. So uh, it was it's, it's something that's there. It's something that uh, we talked about a lot. Uh, but let me let me move on um, with regards to uh, <clears throat> the executive orders that are coming out of the administration right now. They're very concerning to me from the standpoint that uh, by taking uh, one of the executive orders off the books that uh, President Trump put in place that take two rules off the books for every one that he puts on, um, it, it's a signal to me that look out, here come the rules and regulations. And another one that he put that they took off the books was one with regards to guidance, which is extremely important to me. Um, <clears throat> FSOC, which you're a member of, came out and supported uh, the overall rule of not uh, enforcing guidance uh, and had a policy-wide FSOC uh, policy with regards to enforcement of that guidance. The, the administration came out with an executive order that said they're not going to enforce guidance across the entire administration. Now that issue is uh, that executive order has been rescinded as well. So my my question to you is, um, I guess, do you see yourself relaxing some of the, the the constraints that were in place as a result of the rule with regards to guidance? Uh, is this something you're thinking about or are you going to continue to comply with uh, the rule that says you're not going to enforce guidance? We don't enforce guidance and that's not something we're going to change. It. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's concerning to me in that respect because it's something that I think we've worked hard to push out and now we have a new uh, regulator at CPB, which is uh, looks like uh, Richard Carter 2.0, but we'll wait and see once that it comes out. Thank you. The gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on housing, community development and insurance is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you for, for this hearing. I look forward to this every year. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, and the, although I want to do my, the majority of my uh, discussion with you about CRA, uh, I've, I've got to go to this uh, New York Times article and and ask if if what, what is your response uh, uh, to the article, which uh, essentially is suggesting that um, that particularly uh, uh, as it relates to e uh, economists that African Americans are um, not even represented at the level uh, they are uh, in uh, any other particular area. I think that the, 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 the quote was in, in the article, uh, black people are less represented within the field than they are in the field as a whole. So uh, can you give us your uh, take on the article? Is it, is it, uh, Accurate? Is it fair? It's what, what? What do you think? You know, I'm not the one to judge whether it's accurate or fair. I, it's not whether it's fair. I, I, I would say we're not where we want to be on this. Uh, we we do work hard at it. It's uh, something that I'm personally committed with, and that all the leadership of the Fed and the whole Fed is very uh, focused on strengthening our workforce diversity. Um, we are out there aggressively recruiting. Um, both encouraging young minority kids to get interested in economics. I do that. I meet with, with people every year on that. Also, we go to historically black uh, and Hispanic colleges uh, to encourage we, and, and when we find candidates, we, we recruit them hard. Um, and it's just, it's challenging. And I, I would just say it, we're doing a lot of, I'd be happy to uh, come up and, uh, and share it with you in, in a lot of detail, but um, the results are not where we'd like them to be. And, uh, we're wide open to ideas, suggestions uh, as well, and we'll, we'll just keep working on it. And believe me, we're working hard at it. Yeah, yeah. and, I, and I, I appreciate your, your candor on, on that. 
Uh, and I, I know for the Kansas City Fed, for example, uh, you know, they brought it, they, uh, they uh, annually, they were bringing up uh, black students from Kansas City uh, to, to Washington, trying to give them this uh, experience uh, in hopes that some of them would, would eventually want to do this. So I, and I, I'm, that, I, I'm not, I don't think that there has been any intentionality on your part. I'm just trying to figure out what we can do with you to, to be helpful. And, and maybe we could talk about that at a, at a, uh, at a later point. Uh, uh, because I'm, I'm, I'm very concerned about the CRA uh, issue. Um, uh, it came about in 1977, I think, or somewhere uh, about the time. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the initial uh, charge, of course, was that uh, the lending institutions, banking uh, institutions were not giving attention to certain areas of the city and they were not investing uh, uh, and, and, and in some cases not even depositing in those areas. So we, we, we have CRA uh, right now, but I'm having difficulty and I, I'm, I, I intend to talk to the chair uh, about this uh, earlier. I, I haven't uh, didn't do it. Uh, I'm not sure that I can put my fingers on CRA projects or, uh, uh, you know, or what, you know, what they're doing in my local community, maybe, um, you know, they're, they're more visible elsewhere, but uh, are you uh, convinced that CRA is uh, where it ought to be, uh, or should we have some 21st century changes? Uh, in CRA, because maybe as as our chair uh, has said, and I say it where I go, the the one of the issues we have in that that so, same area uh, uh, is uh, the lack of affordable housing, and so uh, you know maybe it's time to look at at a new way in which we can uh, can do CRA where it be where it will be more effective and more visible. Well, we. We place a very high priority on CRA. We think it's an incredibly important uh, law, and we want it to, to be as effective as it can possibly be. Um, and that's that's really what's behind the effort that we we put into our proposal. We took a tremendous amount of input from, you know, the, from the groups who were intended to benefit benefit from it, <clears throat> but also from the financial institutions on uh, who are also eager to you know to make their communities better. So, um, I, but. He, so that's very much the spirit in which we approach this project. If you have particular ideas, we, we'd love to hear them, so. Well, you, you know, regulatory agencies take, you know, having a coordinated a, a approach on CRA, uh, uh, and then maybe that's something uh, that we have to talk about when we have a time, because uh, I think my time is running out. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Chairman. Uh, glad you are here. Uh, I want to do uh, a quick, just sort of technical check. Um, there was a Washington Post article, a number of other articles talking about your time yesterday at the Senate. You talked about uh, the 6.3% uh, January unemployment, but that is closer to 10. Are you just, are you talking about the U6 number that is typically uh, published by Department of Labor? No, I wasn't, although it's not dissimilar. What I was really saying that, you, you know, that if, if you haven't looked for a job in the last four weeks, then you're not, you're not considered unemployed, you're considered out of the labor force. Yeah, so yeah. a whole bunch of people, a couple million people dropped out of the labor force who were actually working and they're counted as, they're not counted as unemployed, but I'm saying for purposes of this exercise, we should think of them as unemployed because uh, they want to come back in. Which I, which I talked about extensively uh, during the recovery, you didn't need to look at the unemployment level you needed to look at the u6 number uh that the department of labor publishes so same idea um, okay all right um i think it's been explored and you've acknowledged there is a a, a completely uneven recovery happening in the economy uh you and i've had a chance to talk about this uh in person as well uh my district uh which is an ag producer i'm a home to gerber baby foods i've got a heinz pickle plant i've got Tyson Foods, I've got a number of uh, specialty crops, blueberries, pickles, asparagus, et cetera. Um, uh, we're, we're heavily uh, uh, agriculture, but we're also a heavy manufacturing district. But the third leg of our economic stool uh, throughout Michigan, but especially concentrated in my district is 
in that hospitality and tourism area. Um, housing fully recovered, as you had said. Manufacturing, uh, at least in our area, uh, especially automotive, office furniture, those types of things, uh, mining, uh, others, uh, manufacturing, uh, very, very strong. What we are seeing, though, is a desperation in that hospitality area. And um, I guess it, it begs the question of whether the economy is actually in crisis writ large, or do we have pockets of crisis within a reasonably healthy economy? I want to give you a quick second to answer that. And then I want to move on to the real estate question that my uh, friend, Mr. Perlmutter, was talking about. I, I want to you know, explore that a little bit more. So the, the losses and the damage are concentrated in those industries that we talked about that you mentioned. Um, it's also the case, though, that a number of other industries are are, uh, are are short of where they would be if there hadn't been a pandemic. So there's a broad amount of slack around, but it's really concentrated in, in those in industries, which are, by the way, which are a big chunk of people. There are 10 million people, fewer people yeah, working, yeah. right? So it's a big it's, number. I will note a lot of that is in Michigan, we have 25% uh, occupancy allowed for a restaurant, for example. Theaters are very sparsely populated. You can't do uh, those types of things. So at some point or another, this isn't a federal issue. It is a local and state issue as to uh, allowing those uh, those concentrations of people, as you as you know. Um, commercial real estate. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more uh, what uh, what's happening in that uh, commercial real estate space, especially? We're seeing very strong residential, but commercial spaces. What Mr. Perlmutter was going after. Significant challenges for uh, for hotels, clearly but also for office. And, you know, the question is gonna be uh, how quickly can we get the pandemic over with and, and find out uh, what, what equilibrium demand is gonna be after that. Uh, people will still be staying at hotels, they'll be traveling, uh, but, uh, you know, office space, certainly in major cities, there may be more commuting, we, we don't know. I think, I think there's a, a more hiccup within that business space, both business traveling as well as what, uh, what uh, work is going to look like. Um, and I've got just a minute here, but um, one of the things I guess I'm getting at is um, there's a concern a lot of us have with this additional stimulus that's going to be getting put into the economy. Certainly the, uh, the, uh, the stimulus that the Fed has been providing. I want to know, is there a risk of overheating the, the economy writ large while uh, by using these broad monetary tools and others to address underperformance in select areas such as hospitality and some of these more concentrated. In other words, are we, are, are we creating a bubble in some of these other areas? You know, so we, our tools work in the aggregate, as you know, at the, at the economy wide level. And uh, I, I would just say that uh, we do expect inflation to move up both because of base effects, as I discussed yesterday, and also because we could have a surge in spending as the economy reopens. We don't expect that to be a persistent longer term force. So while you could see prices move up, that, that's a different thing from persistent high inflation, which we do not expect. And if we do get it, then we have the tools to deal with it and we'll use them. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Himes, who is also the chair of the subcommittee on national security, international development and monetary policy is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Chairman Powell. Um, uh, as you've noticed, we have a, a robust debate going on around here about a major fiscal package. Uh, I'm certainly influenced by what I saw 10 years ago when uh, our fiscal response to another financial uh, crisis was, in my opinion, deeply inadequate. I also believe that when thousands of Americans are dying every week still, uh, it is far better to uh, to risk doing too much than to risk doing too little. Nonetheless, the concerns of, that are being raised about inflation, I think, are valid and need to be um, considered. Uh, I remember the early 80s, late 70s, when inflation destroyed the savings of the middle class and, and, and reduced uh, confidence in the economy, and it was very, very painful getting out of that. So my question for you, Mr. Chairman, is, um, do you believe that there is some combination of expansionary fiscal and monetary policy that could lead to inflation? And, and, and I have two very specific questions. What to you are the leading indicators of that? And the other specific question is, is there some combination of challenge supply chains and surging demand that leads to an unhealthy 
level of inflationary pressure? And are you seeing any of those indicators at concerning levels um, at the moment? You know, so we know that um, inflation dynamics evolve over time, but they don't tend to change overnight. And so we've had, and I remember well, I was in college during the 1970s, I remember well high inflation and this feeling of powerlessness on the part of anyone to deal with it until finally Paul, Paul Volcker did exactly that. And we've been in a low inflation, disinflationary mode ever since. Um, and uh, it, it, so what I see is an economy where there's still a great deal of slack. I see um, the prospect of really significant progress as we put the pandemic behind us, as we see that data, we've got in place guidance that, that tells markets clearly when we will begin to taper asset purchases and when we will begin to raise interest rates when the, when the economy, in that case, when the, when the uh, expansion is very far advanced. So we have our tools, we have them in place, and we think that this is the appropriate policy stance. As I mentioned, um, you know, inflation, uh, it, it's something I remember well, and I'm very familiar with the history of the 1960s. I guess, Mr. Got... Chairman, sorry to interrupt. I guess my question is more about, I, I, I know where you are today, but I'm, I'm curious about what you consider the leading indicators, and in particular, whether you're concerned about challenged supply chains, because, of course, they are challenged. So those are things like supply chains are, unless they're permanently challenged, you know, it, it, there could be a, I mean, take an, take an example of, of the, uh, the chips issue with uh, microchips issue right now. Uh, the automobile industry is having a hard time getting it. So this is a significant economic issue. Um, and if there's a shortage of cars, then prices of cars might go up. That doesn't necessarily lead to inflation because inflation is a process that repeats itself year on year on year. So supply chain issues, as we, as we get back up to full, op, full uh, you know, full economic activity, you could hit supply chain constraints along the way, but that doesn't necessarily mean you, you will have a higher inflationary process if the Fed maintains its credibility and if inflation expectations remain anchored, uh, which they weren't in the 1960s. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I have one more question, um, again, sort of rooted in the experience of 10 years ago. Um, as somebody who was closely involved in the writing of Dodd-Frank, it's very gratifying to hear you say, I think you said that the banking sector has held up quite well. Uh, I remember 11 years ago, we were promised by some that, uh, that Dodd-Frank was uh, going to crush uh, the uh, American capital markets. We were promised by others that at the first sign of a stiff breeze, it would all come apart. And son of a gun, it held up pretty well. Um, but I am always concerned uh, about, uh, about the risk that we don't see. So getting off of monetary policy, uh, uh, it, issuance volume in the high yield market, and I know these are these are a little bit outside of the banking sector, but SPACs. What in my remaining forty seconds give me a sense of of what is concerning to you that could challenge the stability of the financial sector? Well, our policy is accommodative because uh, the, because unemployment is high and the, the labor market is far from maximum employment, we think that's appropriate. We do monitor all those things carefully. Uh, it's true that some asset prices are elevated by, by some measures. It's true that overall asset prices, I would say, are, are somewhat elevated. Uh, at the same time, we have a very resilient banking system and we, we spend a lot of time making the, the capital markets more, more resilient as well. So. Uh, overall, uh, you know, we're we're in a situation where accommodative monetary policy is working through financial conditions to support economic activity, and that's an appropriate thing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam Chair. Time has expired. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Stivers, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I appreciate it. Chairman Powell, thank you very much for being here today. I want to thank you for your steady hand of leadership during these very turbulent times. I also wanna thank you for being the most accessible Federal Reserve Chair in the last decade during my time here through three Federal Reserve Chairs. You've been absolutely the most accessible to us as policymakers and I really appreciate, appreciate that. I wanna acknowledge your comments earlier about an appropriate direction forward uh, for vaccinations to ensure we can open up the economy and job training if we wanna create uh, jobs and get people to your maximum employment target. Uh, I'm not going to have you comment on whether the current COVID response bill uh, focuses on that, because I know you uh, don't want to be put in the middle of that. 
but I think it's fair to say anybody that researches it will see that the job training dollar, job training money uh, rounds to zero and uh, there's not enough focus on vaccinations in my opinion. I do wanna to move to something that I think you, you uh, can and will be willing to talk about and that's um, in the hospitality, travel and entertainment industries. Do you believe banks and the capital markets are currently able to serve their capital needs with the regulatory flexibility you've given them? Yes, yes, I do believe that. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think that one of the problems though, let me ask you is when they're so shuttered and their capacity is reduced, are banks and the capital markets as willing to give them money? Well, that's, a, yeah, um, I think uh, what we see is banks are, are leaning in to businesses, they're working with their customers and leaning into businesses that that are that look like they have good prospects. Yep. You know, you and get I, to a, you get to a place though with I, some of the some of the companies that are really under a lot of pressure where they may be having a hard time getting getting funding. Right, and I think that speaks to the fact that as policymakers, we have been very reluctant to do targeted relief to specific industries. But given the uncertain recovery, and I'm not going to ask you to comment on this. Because uh, I think it is a, a question for policymakers. I do believe that we should focus a little more on some targeted uh, relief to some of those industries. That's why I'm a sponsor of the the Restaurant Act and and this new uh, Gym Act and some other things in the hospitality, travel, and entertainment industries. And I think uh, that would be smart of policymakers moving forward. I do want to allow you because I don't think I've heard you say it uh, to comment on the Federal Reserve's independence. Just remind us uh, whether you work for the for any president or you're independent. We we have certain legal independence, and we think that that arrangement has served the public well. And that's really the point of it is is that uh, we're able to make decisions without considering politics, and um, our lives don't change when elections happen. Until uh, of course the the president has the power of appointment to appoint every term. Yeah, thank you. That that's uh, I do want to quickly move to digital currency. You had a great interaction with, uh, uh, with Ranking Member McHenry about uh, some of your concerns on the policy questions. I just want to quickly, and you brought it up, I just want to quickly speak to the potential disintermediation that could occur with the digital dollar. While I think it's important to keeping the dollar of federal, the uh, reserve currency of the world, I think we need to take a special look at disintermediation. And I want to just remind you something I showed you a few hearings ago of uh, one of the last bank notes from the Citizens National Bank of Ripley in 1929 that my grandfather grandfather got to sign. Uh, I think our financial institutions might be able to play a role in a digital dollar. And I just want you to think through those things. I don't want to ask you to comment on without thinking about it, but I hope you are committed to uh, working with our financial institutions. Yes, that'll be part of the conversation Thanks. for sure. And the, the final thing I want to talk about something Mr. Cleaver talked about, and I want to take a step back and not just focus on CRA, but focus on the, um, the gap in home ownership, uh, the racial gap in home ownership. And I'm curious if the Federal Reserve is paying attention to that as an issue, as opposed to, you know, the four corners of a CRA document, but the issues related to uh, reducing the racial gap in, in home ownership. And I know Mr. Cleaver and I on the housing and insurance subcommittee are very focused on that and trying to work on some things to build a sustainable model. You know, uh, the last time we did this under Barney Frank, we created subprime lending that ultimately blew up the financial markets. I want to make sure that when we do it, we create a sustainable model that can can uh, bridge that uh, gap and bring up the minority home ownership rates uh, significantly. Is that something the Fed's willing to work with us on? We'd be happy to look at that. I mean, our principal role there is to assure to the extent using our tools that that, that gap is not a function of discrimination and it will be to some extent, but we, we use our tools to, to, to go after lending discrimination and, and make try, try to minimize that. Thanks, thanks for your great leader. I yield back my time. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Ohio, Mrs. Beatty is also the chair of the subcommittee on diversity and inclusion and is now recognized for five minutes.
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to Chairman Powell and, on being here today and providing us with your testimony on the salute of monetary policy. I want to start by revisiting a topic that I have raised with you several times over your tenure. And that is, of course, diversity at the federal level. Certainly, this is a topic that I think you can respond to and it won't have an effect on the economy as maybe some of the other questions. You're probably re familiar with it. Last month, the New York Times released an article entitled, Why Are There So Few Black Economists at the Fed? Which found that of the 417 economists that, they, that are employed by the Board of Governors, only two black, that's two out of 417 or 0.5%. While I understand that many will say uh, that something is difficult to find or difficult to hire, just keep in mind two out of 417. I also understand that we need to do more to increase the numbers of black PhD economists in general because they only make up three to 4% of the population in the Federal Reserve's representation are still lower than this number. Further, the reserve banks around the country only have about 1.3% economists that are black. So my question to you, uh, Chairman Powell, and let me just say for the record, uh, I appreciate your contacting me, meeting with me, and always making great strides uh, with OMWI and other things that you've done in this area. But are there any concrete steps that the Federal Reserve uh, can take or that you are taking to increase the number of black economists within its ranks? And do you believe that the Federal Reserve's role as the nation's central bank has a role to play in encouraging diversity and inclusion and the word equity is very important to me in the economic field in general? So I think we do have a role. We are a very large hirer. I think by some measures, the largest hirer of economists in the United States, given, including the 12 reserve banks and the board of governors. So it's, you know, we're an important factor. And as you know, uh, diversity is, is a high priority for me and for my colleagues <coughs> and for our staff. And uh, we do, uh, what we've been doing is recruiting very aggressively and uh, going to not just the, the, the old traditional schools, but also historically black uh, colleges and historic and Hispanic ones as well. And uh, recruiting hard when, when we find uh, appropriate candidates. We also have at different levels, we've got an internship program. We, we do the same thing there, uh, you know, sort of more from an, up, an upstream perspective. We also want to increase the supply because there's a fairly limited supply. Uh, we don't seem to be getting our, uh, our share and we don't know exactly why that is, but we're looking into it. So we're doing everything we can. We're, we're, nobody here is comfortable with, with these numbers, nobody. And you know we're, we're wide open to suggestions on how to do better. Thank you. I have one last question if I have time. Over the course of next year, tens uh, and perhaps hundreds of millions of Americans will be receiving the vaccinations and we'll finally be uh, hopefully placing this pandemic behind us. Looking out to an economic environment post-pandemic in 2022, let's say, what do you believe will be the potential lagging economic impacts of this pandemic? Who and what should the Congress be focusing on to address this from an economic standpoint? Interesting. So, uh, what people want to do is that uh, the, the parts of the economy that are not open right now or not fully open will open up, and people will go back to work. But what we're going to find, based on some of the surveys we've we've uh, heard about, is that not all those jobs are going to come back because people have started to implement automation and things like that. These are these are service sector jobs, and that's an that's been an ongoing process. It will have been accelerated. So. Many of those people may find it hard to get back to work, and I think they're going to need further support. So I, I would be looking at that over time uh, as, as the, the livelihood that they had in the service sector may not be easy to replace. There just might, may not be enough jobs. There's going to be a need for training and replacement and support in the meantime. 
so that these people can hang on to the lives that they have and find new work. Uh, thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, Chairman Powell, thank you for your dependable leadership, especially during the pandemic. And uh, once again, uh, we appreciate your accessibility to uh, members of Congress, especially during this uh, tumultuous time in our economy. As uh, Congressman Luktemeyer pointed out in December, I led a letter to you with 46 of my uh, House Republican colleagues outlining some of the methodological challenges with injecting climate change scenarios into supervisory stress tests. We urged you to take a measured, thoughtful, data-driven approach as you study climate impacts, while some on the other side have urged the Fed to stray outside its mandate and take a more active role in fighting climate change. In your response, uh, you stated, and this is it, your response, you stated that, quote, Congress has entrusted the job of directly addressing climate risks to a number of federal agencies, not including the Federal Reserve, end quote, and that you'll consider climate impacts only when doing so falls within your congressionally directed mandates. In January, the Fed announced the creation of the Supervision Climate Committee, led by Kevin Styro. In a press release about the Styro announcement, New York Fed President Williams said, quote, Climate change has become one of the major challenges we face, which impacts all aspects of the Fed's mission. President Williams' statement seems contrary to the stated board position from your letter and your response to me. Can you please clarify his statement and how the new SCC fits within the board's limited mandate? So I, I, I'm not familiar with the context or, or, or that statement. Um, I'll just say, though, that um, we, we do see uh, the job of the, of the uh, Supervision Climate Committee and our job, frankly, is to assure that uh, the institutions that we regulate and supervise are resilient to all the risks they face, and that includes climate risk. That's a conversation we're having. And by the way, all of the large and medium-sized financial institutions are already having that conversation too. Well, let's, let's drill down a little bit about how expansive um, the Fed will get into this because uh, as you as you know, uh, the Fed recently joined as a member of the Network for the Greening of the Financial System. The NGFS has made some recommendations that, if implemented in the United States, could have harmful effects on U.S. banks and the businesses they serve. Our letter asks that you not import any NGFS standards that would harm the financial system or U.S. businesses, and in your response, you committed to this. How do you plan to evaluate NGFS proposals through the lens of upholding this commitment? Well, as, as I said in the letter, as my colleague and I said in the letter, we, you know, we're not going to import anything into the United States that we don't think is appropriate for the betterment and support and uh, safety and soundness of the, uh, you know, of the U.S. financial system. But we're actually at a much earlier stage than, than any of that, that conversation would suggest. We're really engaged in outreach and in thinking about frameworks. We're talking to these institutions. We're talking to uh, supervisory institutions here in the United States and around the world. So we're, we're at a, we're at an earlier stage then. Well, I, I, I suggest. That, I, and that's, that's good to hear, but I do worry that injecting climate risk scenarios into stress tests could perpetuate the trend of debanking legally operating businesses like fossil fuels. In your letter, you commit that the Fed will not dictate what lawful industries regulated firms can serve. Even without a directive from the Fed, climate scenarios and stress tests may compel firms to debank certain industries to satisfy the spirit of the tests. My, my comment here is that limiting capital allocation to specific industries may itself have implications on financial stability and economic growth through lost jobs, higher energy prices, and compromised energy security. And final point here, uh, I would like the Fed to keep in mind that choking off capital to fossil energy will not only produce the kind of reliability challenges we saw last week in Texas, it will undermine the Fed's maximum employment mandate. Uh, uh, final question on inflation. Um, uh, yesterday, you said you weren't concerned about the threat of inflation, but some of the economic indicators are blinking warning lights for me. High asset prices, rapidly rising bond yields, elevated commodity prices, historically high year-over-year -year increase in the money supply as measured by M2. And these are on top of the unprecedented monetary and fiscal stimulus enacted last year and the $2 trillion fiscal blowout this week. 
within the bounds of the Fed's new monetary policy framework for a long-term running average target for inflation, how high are you willing to let inflation get and for how long before you step in? Um, we don't have a formula in mind. I, I would just say that, uh, um, as I've said you know, earlier, uh, we do expect inflation to move up both because uh, of some sort of technical calculation reasons called base effects, but also because we'll have a surge in spending perhaps later this year. We don't expect that that will be particularly large or even more that it will be persistent because it's in the nature of a one-time thing. Whereas inflation is a process that gets going over a period of years and we, we don't think and, and, and we're committed to, to the idea that it will not become a persistent thing. That's the, it, it is ultimately the credibility of the Fed and our, and our commitment to a price stability mandate uh, that, that holds inflation where it is. We haven't changed that. Well, thank you for monitoring that closely. And I, I believe my time has expired and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Lawson is now recognized for five minutes. Mr. Lawson is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Lawson. Am I unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for calling this meeting. Uh, the Federal Reserve warned of significant rise of businesses, bankruptcies, and step, uh, and steep drops in commercial real estate prices and a reported report of uh, uh, Public uh, published on Friday. Commercial real estate, which I have a great deal of interest in, might be hit against again after the pandemic. Uh, some economists say uh, an increase in people working from home could result in less demand for office space, uh, while stepped up online purchases could force more shutdown of brick and mortar retail and additional vacancies at shopping centers. My, my question to you, sir, is what is the Federal Reserve plan for commercial real estate? Well, um, we don't have a plan specifically for commercial real estate. I, I will say that we do see a number of sectors of commercial real estate that are under pressure, as you suggest, particularly office, hotels, uh, things like that, which are uh, directly affected by pandemic. Um, and uh, you know, the best thing that, that can happen for the commercial real estate sector is for the economy to get back to to full operating status, uh, which by which I mean, get the pandemic behind us. OK, and. And, uh, uh, and there's been a lot of interest even last year uh, in uh, this particular situation, especially as it relates to hotels, uh, the number of people that have been laid off uh, in that industry. Uh, which is significantly higher uh, in that particular area than maybe it is in bailing out the airline industry. Do you see any similarity uh, in the retail industry as related to the airline industry that we bail out? Do I see a similarity between the retail industry and the, and the I, 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 those decisions are not, are not decisions for us. That was a decision made by Congress and the administration has to, um, you know, the provision of the, uh, the particular funding for airlines. We were not part of that uh, discussion. Okay. We part of that well, discussion. It, it, okay, thank you. It had been suggested by some that all of our challenges with unemployment, homelessness, and poverty will be solved uh, if we simply lift local restrictions and open up our economy. But, but since the beginning of this crisis, you have stressed that the, that the path of the economy continuing to depend significantly on uh, the course of the virus. Will you please elaborate on why this is the case and will the economy fully recover so people don't feel safe and comfortable that the virus is contained? Yes, I will. So a big part of the uh, parts of the economy that are not operating at full capacity are the ones that are affected directly by COVID. The rest, big parts of the economy are, are largely recovered or even fully recovered, but that part of the economy is not. And that's travel and leisure, hotels, entertainment, all those things. 
there, and and you know they what what those sectors really need is an end to the pandemic, and people will then become confident again that it's okay to stay in hotels, okay to go on vacations, okay to go to bars and restaurants, and I, you know I frankly think that'll take some time, um, but uh, and it, I think that is the key, the single key factor in in getting that done, that process started and then completed will be will be bringing the, the pandemic to a decisive end as soon as possible. You know, back in January, and I'm trying to run out, uh, you stated that uh, uh, that uh, the winter months were going to be extremely hard on the recovery uh, of the economy. Uh, have you seen uh, uh, that your statement has been pretty much right in terms of where we stand at this point in the recovery in the economy? Yes, yeah, so we, we did go through a very large spike in cases, as you know, they're coming down sharply now. Um, the economy did uh, kind of go sideways for the last uh, through January. I, I mentioned in my testimony, 29,000 jobs a month. It was much higher last summer. Um, and, you know, I think as the pandemic recedes, if it continues to recede, uh, cases, new cases are way down, hospitalizations are way down, then we'll begin to see maybe fairly soon, we'll begin to see the job numbers start to creep back up. Uh, and hopefully this time, that'll be consistent with keeping the virus under control, getting it really okay, under okay. control. Okay, thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And also, Mr. Chairman, thank you for being before our committee today, this virtual setting. Uh, you know, you mentioned that there could be 6% growth. We talked about that all day today by the end of the year. And I completely agree. Well, and think me much faster than that. the uh, fundamentals are there for the economy to easily rebound uh, at this pace. Uh, the biggest obstacle I see that would prevent the level of growth uh, from becoming a reality is individual states focusing businesses, uh, to forcing them to remain closed. Now, for states like mine, Texas, the great state of Texas that have responsibly opened uh, their economies, people are getting back to work. And in December, uh, Texas added 64,000 jobs, while states that are still under heavy lockdowns like California had over 2,000 jobs lost over that same period. So as we talk about the next step in COVID relief, it needs to be focused on getting people back to work. So Mr. Chairman, what would be the best allocation of resources that would uh, incentivize reopening the economy? Well, I, I would say again, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm reluctant to comment. I'm frankly not, I shouldn't comment on, uh, on the legislation that's under consideration and I won't do that. But I, I'll say again, that I think it's uh, at this point, the single biggest thing is to, is to get uh, people vaccinated and um, get, the, uh, get the pandemic um, under control in a decisive kind of a way. And then the economy can fully reopen and people can get confident again that it's okay to resume their normal activities. Okay, I'll buy that. Uh, my district contains some very uh, rural areas that do not have access to reliable broadband internet. And the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed how necessary it is to be connected to the internet if you want to run a business, take advantage of telehealth capabilities or educate your children. Uh, we've got some strange stories that people have to find hotspots in my district and drive hours to get there. Uh, Chairman, can you uh, tell us what it would mean for the economy or economic recovery if we were able to get uh, investment in broadband infrastructure for the thousands of American people that are currently being left behind in this digital world? Again, without commenting on the bill, I would say that uh, broadband is is just a, an essential piece of 21st century infrastructure and having good good broadband everywhere in the country will 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 help uh people in rural areas and poorer people who may not have access and things like that it's just it's a very important piece of infrastructure for us to have as a nation well it is and surprisingly like i said in my district a lot of rural america still does not have it we need to get that and i i think we agree on that uh, lastly during the trump administration you were applauded for maintaining the independence of the federal reserve and focusing on your dual mandate of price stability and full employment you're going to be pushed once again during the Biden administration to uh, use the power of the Federal Reserve to pursue additional political goals, such as addressing 
income inequality or climate changes. And I just want to reiterate that some of my colleagues have already brought that up and Congress is the body that must debate and act on these uh, ancillary issues, not the Federal Reserve. So in closing, Mr. Chairman, can you tell uh, uh, us listening today why it's important for the Federal Reserve to stay independent and not act on the political needs of the moment? I will, I'll be happy to. Uh, the independence of the Fed from direct political control is an institutional arrangement that we think has, has served the country well. And that's why we have it. it, it uh, it's not something that's in the Constitution. It's a practice that we have. We don't, uh, we don't engage in political discussions over here. We don't take politics into consideration or election cycles or anything like that. Nonetheless, we try to be extremely transparent and, and really work hard to, uh, to stay in contact with the body that has oversight responsibility in, in our system of government, which is the two committees on Capitol Hill. That's where our oversight responsibility is, and we take that very seriously. Well, I, I will turn my time back. I want to thank you for the job you're doing and pre appreciate your uh, uh, the hard work that you've generated these last several years. So thank you very much. And Madam Chairman, I yield my time back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Iowa, Ms. Axney, is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman. And thank you, Chairman Powell, for being here. It's good to see you. Uh, I want to focus uh, on the labor market a little bit here. You said a couple of weeks ago that published unemployment rates have dramatically understated the deterioration in the labor market. Uh, and as I understand it, that difference is mostly about the decline in labor force participation. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So that's something that I clearly see in Iowa. Our unemployment in December actually uh, fell back below three and a half percent, but that ignores about 130,000 Iowans who've just left the labor force completely. Is that something that you will be looking at closely when it comes to determining if uh, the economy is at full employment, those folks who have literally just left the market? Yes, it is. We, we say that we look at a broad range of things. And, I, you know, it's important to say that we look at the employment rate and employment to population in particular as, as a statistic that combines labor force participation and uh, unemployment. Okay, good. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. So uh, changing uh, course here a little bit, we've seen about 4 million people leave the labor force. Almost 60% of those have been women, uh, despite them making up, of course, uh, less of the labor force before the pandemic hit. And then we hit a 33 year low last month and more than a million more women have uh, lost their jobs than men. I would ask you, Chairman Powell, what do you think is the reason for this kind of disparity? And is that something you're going to consider when you're evaluating full employment? It's a combination of two things, I believe. One of which is that women are, are in, within the labor force overrepresented in those uh, public facing service sector jobs. The other just is uh, with the closure of many schools parents are staying home and that burden has fallen more on uh, on mothers than it has on fathers. Those are the those are the two pieces of that, I think. And, um, you know, both of those should dissipate and we'd go back to hopefully something closer to where we were, where people worked if they did, if they wanted to work and they did child care if they if they want to do that instead. So um, when the, as the pandemic comes in to an end, we, we hope that people will once again be able to make those choices without you know, without uh, uh, taking into account the fact that the schools are closed, for example. So, thank you. Listen, I'm so glad to hear you bring up child care because um, apparently more than $50 billion a year uh, is what the lack of child care costs our country. Um, do you think that helping families find affordable child care could help the economy? And do you think that would help us get back to full employment more quickly? I, I do think that's a, that's an area that's worth looking at. And again, I don't want to comment on the, I don't know what's in the, your discussions, but I don't want to comment on that. I will say many other countries, our peers, our competitors, advanced economy democracies have a more built up uh, function for, uh, and, and for childcare and they wind up having substantially higher labor force participation among women. We used to lead the world in female labor force participation a quarter century ago. And we no longer do. And, and it may just be that, that those policies have, have put us behind. I appreciate you saying that. Countries like Germany, UK, and Canada have moved forward with higher levels of that participation because of those programs. And it's absolutely something we need to address in this country. 
um, obviously, even before the pandemic, it was prohibitively expensive for families. I, I've been there. I have two boys, and at the most expensive time, even you know, 15 years ago, it was you had to save $20,000 after taxes, uh, and that was 15 years ago for a couple kids. So I know that this is really hurting Americans, and there are childcare deserts. Um, the lack of childcare and paid leave as well really limits the choices for women in America. And every time one of them leaves the workforce to take care of a child, it sets their career back multiple years. Um, so I just want to be clear, this isn't just a women's issue. It's a family issue. It's an economic issue. And I worry that the current crisis for child care could get even worse. Um, it's why it's so important to address these types of long-term issues um, if we're gonna be back to where we need to be as a country. I would also encourage you to look at uh, how you know, paid family leave, um, paid sick leave, all of those issues impact opportunity uh, for women and for families, which in turn, of course, impacts our overall economy. I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing. Uh, appreciate everything that you're doing to try, uh, you know, make sure that we're informed and keeping our uh, country moving forward. And I'd encourage you to take a look at those issues. And lastly, I'd say on the paid family leave, is that something else that you would be considering looking at when it comes to labor market? You know, those are those are decisions that, that lie in your hands. But I, I do think it's worth looking at, at these as the United States falls behind in labor force participation. We need to be asking why that is the case and what are the ways we can, uh, we can be more competitive. On. Thank you. Thank you. The gentle lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Powell, it's great to see you. Thanks for your time on Capitol Hill uh, this week. Uh, and we do appreciate, as everyone has said, your extraordinary leadership and the Board of Governors uh, during this tough past uh, year. Since last March, the Fed has purchased more than $1.8 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities. And last week, you reiterated, as you did yesterday in the Senate, that the Fed remains patiently accommodative uh, in its monetary policy position. But this extraordinary amount of accommodation is now coupled with the decision that the Treasury has recently announced, uh, Chair Yellen, that they are planning on drawing down their cash account they hold at the Fed by almost a trillion dollars, uh, which would inject that directly into the economy. My question, uh, Chairman Powell, is, has Secretary Yellen uh, discussed with you drawing down the Treasury account? As a matter of long practice, I. Uh... I don't discuss uh, my private conversations with elected representatives or with the Treasury Secretary. But of course, we're well aware. You know, there's a there's an ongoing staff level dialogue. You know, about between Treasury and the Fed and the New York Fed about about the Treasury General account and what the plans are for that. So we're well aware of it. If if a trillion dollars was drawn out of that account and injected, do you think that could cause short-term interest rates, something you're very concerned about at the Board of Governors and a very keen focus monetary policy, could that cause short-term rates to go negative? So it could play, it could put downward pressure on short-term rates. Of course, our principal concern is that the federal funds rate be within the uh, the range that the FOMC has, has, uh, has ordered it to be. And we have the tools to make sure that that's the case. And if that is the case, and it will be the case, that we'll be within our range, we'll be where we need to be. That's going to that's going to tend to work against the other, you know, short term money market rates going uh, too low. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a it's a key key point. That's why I'm I'm concerned about that impact in the market understanding it. I mean, for example, I, I assume the Board of Governors from a monetary policy reaction to that. If short-term rates went negative, is you could raise the rates on the uh, IOER uh, range that you have. Is that would that be a tool that you could take into effect? Yes, we you know, haven't, haven't made any decisions about this at all. But but of course that and and also the the, the rate on the reverse repo facility are, yeah. are the two things that that we can move. And as it, these are those are our two administer, administrative rates, administered rates. And so those would be the tools that we can use, among others, frankly, but that's, that's that, those are things that we can do. Well, certainly in, in light of what Ann Wagner asked about a few minutes ago on the supplemental leverage ratio, these things kind of come together in the banking system and managing those expectations, either the level of short-term rates or the dislocation in rates and the Fed's reaction to it, or uh, that kind of cash coming out into the banking system 
and thus uh, aggravating that supplemental leverage ratio. These are important issues, and I would encourage the the board to consider action sooner rather than later because of that March 31 date. Um, Chairman Himes raised a really interesting question, and, and uh, Mr. Barr did as well about the indicators you look at when you're evaluating this inflation uh, move. Um, we've mentioned raw uh, commodity index. I think other members have mentioned that it's up 18% year over year. Gold is up 15% year over year. But the one I always watch, and, and we we saw it come into play uh, in the run up to the last financial crisis, is uh, residential real estate. Um, as you know, 24% of the CPI is an imputed rent uh, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics uses. I've never bought it. I don't know if you've ever bought it, but it's up uh, about 3% right now. But if you look at the prices of existing homes, I think they're up 12. New home prices are up 8%. Is that one that you particularly focus on, that imputed uh, residential rent since it is about 25% of the CPI and, and, and how do you look at that issue? We do, of course, follow uh, a broad, broad range of prices. It's, you know, it's half of our mandate is price stability. So we're, we have a, a lot of attention paid to, to many different things. The most important thing really is inflation expectations are the anchored and we have great tools for looking at it, looking at that, including a new common index of uh, inflation expectations. You ask about real estate housing, residential real estate prices, and you know the the, the very high levels of increases, the high levels of increases we saw this year. There were a bunch of one-time factors. There was a, a suppression of demand at the beginning, and the increase in demand uh, as the as that that industry reopened. Rates are low. People are st working at home. All those things tend to rates rates will be low for some time, but but people at home won't be forever. And all those things tended to push up demand. Uh, our best estimate is that we will see this increase, but to be much, much lower level. Thank, Thank you. you Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kasten, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Powell, it is so nice to see you again. And I, I mean this genuinely. The, you have a hard job and you have always favored You've always biased in favor of clarity rather than opacity as you balance some of the political tensions of your job. And we appreciate that and the country appreciates that. It makes our jobs easier. Um, I mentioned that at the start because I want to sail into issues that are political but shouldn't be. And it's been the subject of a lot of my colleagues' questions around climate change. Um, the transition to a greener economy, you know, as lots of smart people have said, imposes physical risks and transitional risks. The physical risks, I don't think, present much of a political challenge. You know, we what's happened in Texas, I think there is, um, nobody suggests that we shouldn't be dealing with those types of physical risks to our economy. The transitional risks are hard, though, because converting to a clean energy system means converting to an energy system that has lower marginal operating costs, which leads to a rising tide. It's good for the economy, but the fact that a rising tide lifts the average boat doesn't mean it lifts every boat. And, and at core, that transfer is a, it, the transitional risk is a wealth transfer from energy producers to energy consumers. You pay less for energy, but now somebody's got to write off the, their, their fossil fuel reserves. That, in my view, informs much of the political risk that, or the political conversation that exists. So I'll get to in a minute why I start that way, but, but first I just want to follow up on what, um, what Chair Velasquez asked. Um, on Monday, Janet Yellen said that climate change is a part of the broader mandate of the Treasury Department. Do you agree that the economic risks of climate change are part of your broader mandate as well? I think that we have a mandate to assure the safety and soundness of financial institutions, and that involves uh, making sure that they manage and understand all of the risks that they face, and that includes climate change risk. Okay. Um, well, I certainly do. I think some of the estimates are north of $20 trillion a year of loss. Um, last week, um, Governor Brainerd um, noted that there have been over $5.2 trillion in the losses associated with the physical risks of climate change. Since 1980, 70% of that, um, which is not insured, and of course that is accelerating. 
what is the Fed doing specifically about the exposure that the financial sector has to those physical losses from climate change? Uh, so as I, as I mentioned, we're really in the early stages of, uh, of understanding this. Right now, we're doing a lot of outreach. We're talking to different size financial institutions and other external constituencies, uh, our fellow regulators here in the United States and around the world to try to, um, we, we don't have a framework for thinking about this. Uh, there are tremendous data gaps. It's not, uh, it's, it's just early days. And by the way, you, if you, if you talk to the, certainly the large and medium sized financial institutions, you'll find they are very actively doing the same thing. They're trying to think about how, what are the implications longer run implications, near term implications of this. How do I think about it? Uh, and, and so I would just stress that it's, it's early days. And I also want to stress that, you know, the, the, the nation's climate policy has to be decided by elected people. We are not climate policy makers here who can decide, uh, you know, the way climate change will be addressed by the United States. We're in a regulatory agency that regulates a part of the economy. And part of that job will be to assure, as I said, but it's, it's not the, we're not the so, so central I, issue here. I, I don't mean to be rude, but I got two more questions I want to hit. I, I completely agree. And that's why I led, I led off by noting that there is this political challenge because of the wealth transfer, because we, we need, you know, we, we are political creatures on our side of the dais here. And you noted to Mr. Lutkemeyer that stress tests and scenario analysis are very different. And I totally agree. Um, the beauty of scenario analysis is that it's flexible. It can accommodate more information, particularly as we get into some of these transitional risks. The downside is that they're flexible and therefore they are going to be subject to political pressure. So we can't do those very well from our end. But as you think about how to build the modeling infrastructure in the Fed, how are you thinking about how to build that in a way that is accurate, that captures the risks, but allows you to maintain the, the political independence you need? So, you know, that's, that's a good way to capture it. It's quite a challenging exercise. These, these are, it's scenarios. And by the way, the, some of the banks are already running these scenarios. They're already thinking about it. They're, they're supposed to be informative. They're supposed to be illustrative kind of thing. That's what they're not at all like stress tests. And it's, it's just worth this level of thinking, how do we model this? And, and what are the implications of how we model it for, for our business today? One thing we're doing is we're, the Bank of England is, is, is ahead on this. They're, they're working on this. So we're very closely monitoring and, and, and ongoing discussions with them. I just think there's a lot of work to do here before we can really, um, you know, make progress. Well, thank you. I yield back a minute ago. Thank you. <laughs> um, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you to the chairwoman for holding today's hearing and the ranking member, uh, Chairman Powell. Uh, one of, you're one of the un unsung heroes of responding to the pandemic. Uh, I want to thank you and your team uh, for your efforts throughout 2020. Uh, that, that's also included a standing up and fine tuning the liquidity facilities. Uh, for example, the original municipal liquidity facility had excluded Suffolk County, which is my home county, uh, but the Federal Reserve and Treasury listened to the concerns that I and others raised and lowered the population thresholds for the eligible issuers. Uh, this provided an important uh, possible backstop for local governments concerned about liquidity when they issue debt. Uh, I appreciate the Federal Reserve's attention to this critical market and the commitment to remain vigilant of any problems as they arise because we do need all levels of government working together. Another issue with which I'm concerned with is the rising national debt, which now stands at over $27 trillion. The scariest part of this issue is the fastest growing part of our federal budget is paying interest on our national debt. And that's right now, uh, operating at a time when interest rates are historically low. Uh, you testified uh, before the Joint Economic Committee on November 13th, 2019, and you said, quote, in a downturn, it would also be important for fiscal policy to support the economy. However, as noted in the Congressional Budget Office's recent long-term budget outlook, the federal budget is on an unsustainable path with high and rising debt. Over time, this outlook could restrain fiscal policymakers' willingness or ability to support economic activity during a downturn. 
In addition, I remain concerned about that high and rising federal debt can, in the long term, restrain private investment and thereby reduce productivity and overall economic growth. Putting the federal budget on a sustainable path would aid the long-term vigor of the U.S. economy and help ensure that policymakers have the space to use fiscal policy to assist in stabilizing the economy if it weakens, end quote. That's the, uh, those were the end of your uh, remarks I just wanted to cite. The national debt stood at roughly $23 trillion at that time. Since then, we've gone through a downturn due to widespread lockdowns as a result of the pandemic, and Congress has passed five bipartisan COVID-19 response bills. We are still struggling with a fragile economy, and many restaurants, small service industry businesses, and others still need assistance to succeed in rebounding from the pandemic. I've been supportive of targeted help. This can't be an across-the-board handout because someone's going to have to pay the bill. We definitely shouldn't be appropriating more funding in areas where they haven't even used the funding that's already been appropriated. Uh, Chairman Powell, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about what you said in November of 2019 and why it still matters at this time for the future. I'd be glad to. So we're, uh, we're on an unsustainable fiscal path, which just means that even in good times, the, the, uh, the debt is growing faster than the economy. That's kind of the one definition of, of unsustainability. And we need to get off that path. We will get off that path. I would say the time to prioritize those uh, concerns is not now. It's when the, the time to prioritize those concerns is when we're close to full employment, when the taxes are rolling in and we can do it uh, without so much pain. Right now, um, fiscal policy is, I think, appropriately working, as I suggested in, in those uh, remarks. Uh, fiscal policy really, really came to the rescue in, in this episode with the CARES Act and the subsequent uh, things that have been done. So I do think it's important to save that firepower for, for big times, times when, when it's really needed. Uh, and this is one of those times. Uh, at this time, uh, the uh, Congress is about to pass a $1.9 trillion dollar COVID-19 related bill, but a lot of that spending won't be until 2022 or later. Some of that spending isn't even to be spent until 2014 or later. Um, and I just wanna know what your thoughts are uh, on so much of that funding in this week's bill uh, not even being used any time this year. You know, so I, I, I think it's not appropriate for me to insert myself into these discussions, which are really the province of you and your elected colleagues. We have a uh, we have a narrow and important mandate, and and we're generally not consulted or part of these these uh, discussions, and that's appropriate. Chairman Powell, I appreciate your uh, your leadership. Uh, you really did a fantastic job uh, responding to the pandemic, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Presley, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Chairman Powell. Uh, when we last spoke in front of this committee one year ago, you thanked me for sharing the history of these Humphrey Hawkins hearings and the legacy of Coretta Scott King and her advocacy for a federal jobs guarantee. Today, we're in the midst of the greatest economic disaster since the Great Depression. And during the height of that crisis, the federal government created 4 million jobs in the winter of 1933. Chairman, you've noted that the goal of maximum employment will require more than supportive monetary policy. Would a federal jobs program succeed where monetary policy and the private sector have been unable to meet the need? So I was speaking really about the longer term and the need to have policies that support peoples, that give them the skills and training that they need to take part, and also policies that support participation in the labor market. I think it's up to you to pick the uh, the particular policies, but I do think it can't just be a matter of monetary policy because uh, we can help over the course of, of, a, of an expansion, but there are longer term issues that will support maximum employment over time that are really in your hands. Agreed. And uh, the federal government can create uh, jobs that meet the scale and speed necessary, I think, to meet this moment. Last week, I introduced uh, House Res 145, a federal jobs guarantee calling for just that. A central demand of the civil rights movement, a job guarantee is about more than just jobs and the dignity of work. It's about the necessary public services 
and critical but long neglected physical and care infrastructure we can provide. A federal job guarantee is our opportunity to achieve a just recovery as well as long term economic equity. In this pandemic, uh, as you're aware, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, women have lost 5.3 million jobs, a million more than men. Women of color have sustained the highest unemployment rates. In fact, in December alone, 154,000 women, black women, left the workforce, the result of lost jobs and the caregiving crisis. This reality is devastating, but you recently noted that even the sobering unemployment data that we have has incredible gaps in measurements. Specifically, that if we consider the near 4 million people who have stopped looking for jobs, the actual unemployment rate would not be 6.3% as reported by the Bureau um, of Labor Statistics, but close to 10%. So how does Chairman Powell, the undercounting of unemployment, prevent us from achieving an equitable economic recovery? And what does this mean for women of color specifically? I, I think that the, the, that the numbers, this is, by the way, it's not a criticism of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They, they're very transparent about what they do. And conceptually, we, I think that you include those people who were in the labor force working and now they're out of the labor force, but they're actually unemployed, for my way of thinking. Um, you know, women and women of color in particular are overrepresented in, in those public facing service sector jobs, which have been so hard hit in hotels and restaurants in and, and so this, this uh, downturn has just been terrible from the standpoint of affecting a, a group that already was financially less able to, to withstand those kinds of things. It's, it's uh, from that standpoint, particularly since we had begun to make significant progress, some progress on those issues, those longstanding disparities. So, uh, you know, we're, we're in a situation where the best thing we can do is get those sectors open uh, as soon as possible. And in the meantime, give people the support they need so they can continue the lives that they've had. Sure, that, under, that undercounting though, um, I do believe it's just another way that our economy uh, renders invisible and further marginalizes those workers consistently uh, who are the last ones hired and the first ones fired, particularly uh, true for our disabled workers, LGBT, black women, those who have been disproportionately, to your point, employed in the service sector, low wage jobs that have been deemed uh, essential uh, but are often treated as if they are dispensable. Um, and that's not true only in a pandemic, but uh, especially so. Uh, so Chairman Powell, looking to pass recoveries for the workers shouldering the heaviest burdens of this pandemic, will they recover their jobs as quickly as they lost them? What are your projections there? We don't have um, great confidence in our, in our ability to project that, but I would say as the economy reopens, there should be a, a wave really of people going back to work in those sectors. The question is going to be, some of them will not be able to go back to work because you know, we're hearing their surveys suggesting that those companies have been figuring out ways to do their business with, with fewer workers. And they, they, they're doing that all the time, but that process may have been accelerated because of this episode. So uh, it, it's pretty likely that, that some of those people will not be able to go back to their old jobs and they're going to need continued support and help to find their way in this post-pandemic economy, which will be a different economy. The gentle lady's time has expired. The gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Longermilk, is now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and Chairman Powell. Thank you for being here. And uh, let me tell you, the four years that I've been on the committee, um, it's it's been a roller coaster ride, uh, especially with the pandemic. And I appreciate how you have worked with us uh, during that time. I also want to thank you for the interim final rule that the, the Fed issued with the OCC and FDIC back in November that provided tem uh, temporary relief for community banks from asset thresholds. As you know, pandemic relief programs, especially or particularly PPP, have resulted in rapid growth of our uh, financial institutions balance sheets. And as a result, several hundred community banks were on the verge of being subject to additional regulations because of having PPP on their books. So I appreciate you and the other agencies addressing that. And I think that's an illustration of how we can put partisanship aside and do what's rest, uh, best for the American people uh, and for our uh, banks. 
So a question I have is I'd also like to discuss the Community Reinvestment Act as others have done today as well. I appreciate your comment earlier today that you're working with the OCC and the FDIC to get on the same page. As you know, the pandemic has accelerated the use of digital platforms like mobile and online banking. What I'd like to know is, will you and the Fed take that into account during the CRA reforms? Yes, that, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is very much part of our, we understand that banking has changed and that's one of the important ways in which it's changed and uh, that requires a rethink. It's been a quarter century since we had one and that's a, that's a big part of why we're at the table. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, recent, last week, we had a markup on this uh, this huge bill that's coming to the floor, and I would appreciate if, if our colleagues on the other side would have the same uh, outlook of addressing uh, the changes in technology as we attempted to have fintech included in, uh, in, in the package, but weren't able to do so. So hopefully going forward, that will also become a bipartisan issue that uh, we can work together. So another question, uh, Chairman Powell, could you remind us for what you see for the economic outlook for 2021. I believe you said that the economy should bounce back strongly and may grow at a rate of 6% this year. Is that true? Well, so I, I, I someone asked a question yesterday. They said, said, could it be 6%? And I said, yeah, it could be 6%. You know, that there's a range of estimates. Um, we, I last made, you know, we're constantly updating things, but we'll be doing another round of estimates uh, for growth this year uh, at our March meeting. We do quarterly updates. Of course, we're updating them in real time in the meantime. But the, the bigger point is, it all depends on getting the pandemic under control and getting people vaccinated. And it depends to some extent on these, these other strains that, that may be around, haven't really had much of an effect yet, apparently, on infection rates, and we hope that continues. So, but there's, as I mentioned in my testimony, there's a reason for optimism about the second half of the year if we do get the pandemic under control. And that's, that's what many people are forecasting now. And uh, of course, we're gonna wait and see the actual data before we act on it. We're not acting on forecasts when it comes to our policies at this point. So whether it's four and a half percent, five percent, six percent, you still believe that we should bounce back strongly? Yes, I do. I think that's the base case. I think there's plenty of risk, but uh, I would say that is, that's certainly the base case. Well, that is, that's good to hear. I think we've laid the foundation over the past four years of a strong economy, as long as we don't undo a lot of that. But I want to take a step back and think about really the economy in general and our ability to recover and the, the fact that you think that we're going to have a strong recovery. Um, as I mentioned earlier, later this week, the majority party in the House will attempt to pass a $2 trillion bill that economists are saying is six and a half times bigger than what is actually needed. In fact, less than 9% of it would go to actually combating the virus through public health spending, as you have indicated already, is really what the key to this economy is, getting the virus itself, the healthcare aspect, under control and, and constraint. But only 9% of this bill is dealing with that. So I'm not gonna ask you to comment on fiscal policy because I know that's not your job but Congress should take the Fed's economic projections into account and recognize the economy is on strong track to recover and recover strongly. The bill is many times bigger than it should be, and it would spend trillions on items have nothing to do with COVID and continue to accelerate the debt that this nation has that is running quickly out of control. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Garcia is now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for hosting uh, Chairman Powell for this very important uh, report. And Chairman Powell, it's a pleasure to see you again, and thank you for all the work uh, that you've done to get us through this pandemic. I mentioned to someone, you just about threw everything but the kitchen sink at the issue. Uh, and quite frankly, that's what was required to make sure that all parts of the economy uh, will get back on track. Uh, as a former uh, local uh, city official, in fact, I was city controller in Houston, I'm always concerned about the municipal bond markets and what is happening for cities uh, in terms of meeting their obligations on any debt, being able to continue to issue debt, and in getting past uh, this pandemic. And I know that uh, all of us have called for the extension of the municipal liquidity uh, fund 
but because it was shut down at the end of 2020, states and cities can no longer rely on the M MLF as a backstop. According to recent analysis from the Philadelphia Fed, state and local government employment is lower by 1.3 million since the pandemic, nearly double the losses from the 08 recession. And states are using reserves, federal aid, and the capital markets to contend with budget deficits prior to the extreme austerity. I know I spoke to my mayor um, during our district work week this last couple of weeks, and uh, there were the city of Houston was already at about 120 million shortfall, and that's not even looking at the decrease in plummeting uh, collections on property taxes, because. Uh, the city of Houston is about 40% relying on property taxes. What can we do, uh, given the absence of the MLF and the precarious fiscal conditions that states and cities face? What sort of steps will be taken to avoid further public sector job losses or disruption in the municipal bond market? Well, the so the municipal bond market, I'm happy to say, has continued to function very well. Uh, even after the facility uh, closed. And uh, I'm again, I'm happy to say that I was concerned uh, that uh, it was serving a, a purpose as a, as a useful backstop uh, and it ended in, in, uh, at the end of December and nonetheless, the market's uh, working just fine. Um, in terms of other support, it's not, not for us to say. I, I would say that the, there, the disparities between different cities and states are enormous in this situation. Some cities and states are actually better off. The ones that are leveraged to either energy or tourism are not better off because those are the areas that have been hit by the pandemic. And so but that's really a question for fiscal authorities in terms of what uh, further help would, would, would be appropriate. In terms of access to financing, it's really there. The, the, uh, the municipal bond market is, uh, is open and, and uh, uh, right across the credit spectrum and the maturity spectrum, there's been the ability to finance. All right, thank you. Uh, also, the last, one, during one of our previous visits, I had asked you about, uh, I was curious as to why the, the poverty rates uh, were not looked at more closely, in, in just like we look at unemployment. Because as you've noted uh, already, uh, the unemployment number is not perhaps the, the best true number of the people that are out of jobs. Uh, and certainly, there's a lot of poor people that are not included in those numbers because they not only not have jobs, they're also not, not a part of the labor market, they're also not on unemployment. And I did note on your February report on page 19 that you noted that food pantries saw a significant increase in demand in 2020, and there was a sharp increase in the number of families reporting that they did not have sufficient money to buy food. Do you what else do you all do to track that in terms of poverty rates, the, the number of people that are reliant on the SNAP program, the number of people that are reliant on other public benefits to to, to give us a, a better picture of how many people may not be working? Um, so we do look at all of the, all of that data. We don't collect that data. Other other parts of the government do. And I think we've all been struck. Uh, how could you not be struck by the by the uptake at the at the the, the food in the food area where people are in line, these miles long uh, uh, car uh, lines for to get food. It's it's just it's some some families are clearly in a place where they <clears throat> where they need help from the government just to feed their families. So um, it's it's a sign that uh, you know that that support is needed, and that we really need to get the economy recovered as soon as possible. Well, thank you. I believe my time is up. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Davidson, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Chairman Powell, thank you for your time. And really uh, want to commend the Federal Reserve for the work that was done at the end of March to provide liquidity and stability to our economy, to deal with the massive surge in demand for U.S. dollars. And uh, we're just so grateful that the U.S. dollar has become the world's reserve currency in a time of crisis, not just Americans, but people all around the world want our dollar. It is indeed a source of our strength as a country is to have 
a, a strong dollar uh, that has become the world's reserve currency. It does great things for our capital markets and frankly helps enable uh, the deficit spending that we've continued to do uh, because we certainly haven't saved for bad times. We're able to navigate them because we still can borrow. Um, I wonder, sir, do you have a definition of sound money? We target uh, inflation that averages 2% over time. That is, that is what we consider to be. Well, that's a policy, but I mean, when you think of sound money, what would you say constitutes sound money? Well, the, the public has confidence in the currency, which they do, which the world does. Uh, that's, that's really what it comes down to, that people believe that, that the United States currency is, is um, perfectly reliable and, and stable in value. Okay, so as a store of value, uh, it clearly isn't stable in value. It, it, it is not. Um, but as a store of value, the U.S. dollar really, is it diluted is, as a store of value uh, when M2 goes up by more than 25% in one year? Does, that, does the printing of more U.S. dollars somehow diminish the value of the dollars that others hold? You know, um... There was a time when uh, monetary aggregates were important determinants of inflation, and that has not been the case for a long time. So you'll see, if you look back, uh, the correlation between movements in different aggregates, you mentioned M2, uh, and, and inflation uh, uh, is just very, very low. And you see that now, where inflation is at 1.4% for this year. Both. Uh, yeah, you keep, you keep using that. You keep using it uh, to talk about inflation. And I don't think that's the only proxy for, you know, whether the dollar is a, is a store of value and an efficient means of exchange. It is uh, clearly the, still the world's reserve currency, but we're, we're putting it under a pretty big stress test by diluting the value of the dollars. And I think one of the indicators of that is when the U.S. government issues debt, uh, all this spending that we've done as a country, um, it isn't really funded, is it? I mean, there's not a true market demand for this much debt. It's not being lent. When there's borrowing, there's actually a lender. Um, how much has the Federal Reserve had to purchase to bridge the gap between market demand for treasuries and, actual, and, and the actual need to finance the spending? That's, that's not at all what's happening. We don't have to purchase any of this. There is, we purchase it because it is providing accommodative financial conditions and supporting the economy in, in keeping with our mandate. There's plenty of demand for, for U.S. Uh, Treasury paper around the world. So all of it would sell, you're competing. So are, are you bidding up the price then? Is it, is it your contention that you're inflating asset prices by, by um, increasing this purchase? No, I, I think that all, we could sell all of our debt. That's the, the reason we do it. But by the way, we issue debt when we, we issue United States obligations in the form of reserves when we buy treasuries. So we're not actually changing the amount of obligations outstanding on the part of the What we're doing is we're substituting an overnight reserve for a treasury bill. It has no effect on the overall outstanding obligations of the United States when we do that. Right. So, uh, so the growth of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet you don't think that has anything to do with the, the disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street? Or let's just take as an example the confidence people have expressed in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, and, and, you know, well-respected proven investors like Ray Dalio, who said cash is trash. Isn't it because the U.S. dollar is being destroyed by fiscal and monetary policy? It's hard to say that it's being destroyed. I mean, that, that if you look at, so another way to look at the dollar, if you mentioned the dollar, uh, you can ask domestically what what can it purchase, and that's a question of inflation. You can also look at at, at in terms of a basket of other currencies. And the yes, dollar, I understand. But if you look at it, if you look at it, sir, the dollar is in the right. time. The key is the key to this is uh, the monetary. The, the Fed has done a horrible job at predicting asset bubbles. They have, and if the pensions are going up because the market prices are going up, people with marketable securities have their basket of. Uh, wealth going up and wages aren't current consumption teachers for example they have a great pension but their current consumption isn't going up so cpi lags what's going on in the in the investment i think it's a big concern and i would just implore you and the other members of the fed to pay attention to monetary inflation not just 
gentleman from price inflation. Five. I yield. The gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Williams, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Chairman Powell, for joining us today. Chairman Powell, the American people are looking to us to deliver a strong economic recovery. And as we work to vaccinate more Americans and end this pandemic, we're going to need smart fiscal and monetary policy to combat our country's economic downturn. So, Chairman Powell, you previously credited the past stimulus payments and unemployment benefits for helping jumpstart the economy. Given the current state of the economy, do you still believe these are tools that can that can both boost aggregate economic activity as well as help those disproportionately impacted by the pandemic? In principle, yes, I think that's what those tools do. I'm not commenting on on the, the bill, though, that you're working on right now. I don't want to be heard to be supporting or not supporting the fiscal package that you're voting on this week. Understood. Do you believe that decisions made about fiscal and monetary policy can help determine the speed of a full economic recovery? Very much so. So could failure to use these tools delay our return to full employment, even if we get folks vaccinated quickly? Again, I'm not going to comment on, on uh, fiscal policy. Uh, we're committed to using our tools until the economy is, is fully recovered. Chairman Powell, in your expert opinion, in what ways could monetary and fiscal policy be employed at this time to ensure our economic recovery is inclusive of communities of color and addresses racial economic disparities? So we, we don't have, uh, our tools lift the uh, entire economy and aren't targeted toward particular groups, but I will say that what we saw uh, in the last couple of years of the long expansion was that at very low levels of, of unemployment, very high levels of employment, high levels of participation, we saw benefits going to those at the lower end of the spectrum, which means disproportionately African Americans, other minorities, and women. And we, we saw that happening pretty consistently over the last two years. So with our tools, what we can do is, is try to get us back to that place where we have a strong labor market, str high levels of employment, high levels of participation, wages are moving up, and those benefits can be shared really broadly. That, that is really the main thing. It's not the only thing, it's the main thing that we can do. Thank you so much, Chairman Powell. And Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. It's now recognized for five minutes. Yeah. Madam Chair, the uh, sound cut out. Would you verify that that's me, the gentleman from North Carolina? Yes, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Bud, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Powell, again, thanks for being here today. Massive $1.9 trillion COVID relief bill. So, based on past relief bills, uh, would it be safe to assume, or, or you know, it would be safe to assume that we're going to see an increase in deposits stemming from that 1.9 trillion dollars? But of the SLR or the temporary supplemental ratio leverage ratio, would that be beneficial for banks to handle these deposits? Um, so we, the uh, temporary exemptions from the SLR that we put in place last year. Uh, expire at the end of March, and we're in the process of looking at that right now. I've got nothing to announce on that today, and I, I, uh, it's a conversation my colleagues and I are having. I'm, I'm reluctant to get into the merits of the arguments at this point because it's something that I don't want to, you know, pr presume or get ahead of that conversation. Understand, and, and understand you may not want to commit to this part, but have you considered finalizing the 2018 interagency proposal? We're, we're looking at what to do uh, on, on the supplemental leverage ratio, and I'm, I really would rather just leave it at that for now, if I can. Understood. Um, Chairman Powell, yesterday you mentioned uh, that the digital dollar, it's a high priority project for the Fed. I um, appreciate that, but you also went on to mention that the Fed is more focused on getting it done right rather than getting it done fast. So getting it done right, especially for a project like this, we can all appreciate that. Now, now I know, uh, you know, the, the U.S. dollar is a reserve currency of the world, and I think we hope that doesn't change anytime soon. But with that being said, um, a lot of other countries are just leaps and bounds ahead of us when it comes to digital currency. A couple of them, I think of the, the digital yuan, yuan uh, Sweden's uh, e-krona, um, also in U Ukraine, and even in Uruguay, in the e-peso. 
Uh, is there any worry that the U.S. is falling way behind the rest of the world in, in the development of a, a, a CBDC? And does this staggered start, do you think that puts the U.S. at a disadvantage? No, I don't. You know, we are the reserve currency of the world, and, and that is because of our great democratic institutions, our vibrant economy, and, and just that we are the incumbent, and uh, we have relatively low inflation. The value of the dollar has been relatively stable for some years now. And um, so I, I think we will be that. I, I think it's, it's, it's a very, very important decision that we make. And, and there, there are potential pitfalls. There are issues around privacy and how you structure it. And, you know, we, again, it would be to, to, to do it as quickly as possible and get it wrong would be a very bad idea. So we're going to be careful. I do think that we have the time to think this through carefully. I'm not concerned that, that other uh, countries are, are experimenting with this, uh, you know, we, but I have to say it's possible now. Technology has made it possible and it's happening and the private sector is doing it too. So we understand that we need to be in a position of, of really understanding it and doing it if it's the right thing for Americans. Thank you. You know, we're quickly approaching the one-year mark of the first implementations of the <laughs> widespread lockdowns. And since then, we've been battling the continued public health crisis and the economic fallout that's come from that. So how much longer can our economy sustain the current level of unemployment? And also on top of that, the lack of economic growth before we really begin to suffer even more negative economic impacts. That, that has been a, a major concern since the very beginning is people out of the labor market for too long. They lose, they lose their skills. They lose touch with the industry they worked in. It's, it's called scarring is the technical term, but really it's just people losing the lives and livelihoods that they've had. So we've been very concerned that we, look after those people and, and also that, uh, that we get the economy reopened uh, as quickly as it safely can be. And of course that does ride heavily on, on get, having the pandemic brought to a decisive end as soon as possible. Any timeline, I mean, you know, if, if we're, we're now February, uh, if we continue as is, how long, before, um, how long before this scarring, as you called it, really has a negative economic impact that's even more permanent? It's very hard to say, you know, if we, um, I, I would say that um, we seem to be on a path to avoid. We haven't seen the kind of scarring either among smaller businesses or among people that we have been concerned about. We, we haven't seen that. The labor market's come back faster. The level of bankruptcies has been lower. It's happening, but it's happening at a much slower pace. You know, you see what, the what, cases what? coming down, you see vaccinations happening. We have the prospect of getting back to a much better place in the second half of this year. I understand. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Talib, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, thank you, Chairman uh, Powell, for being with us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to start in talking a little bit about my district. Uh, when we do discuss the state of the economy, I believe our hyper focus on the stock market always has us forgetting the dire situation for our low wage workers. Uh, and let's remember that half of the American people do not own a single share of stock. And we continue to hear about how the stock market, market is booming and the economy is bouncing back. But where I come from, Chairman, we are not seeing that recovery. The national unemployment rate in December was 6.7% nationally again. Uh, but in Wayne County, Michigan, the district I represent, it, it was nearly double, 12.4%. So we know that software uh, engineers, our investment bakers, attorneys might be able to do their jobs remotely. But if you are a taxi driver, a restaurant server, a barber, you cannot work from home. So as of last month, our employment uh, in the lowest paying uh, job tier was at 20% below pre-pandemic levels. This is why I continue to call for reoccurring monthly payments of 2000. So Chairman Powell, in your opinion, what would sending $2,000 uh, check, a $2,000 survival uh, survivor check to, survival check to uh, every American mean for the health of our economy? And what would it mean for our nation's most economically uh, vulnerable? Um, I, I'm very sorry. Uh, I, I... I don't want to talk about a provision that's actually in the current bill. I will echo, though, that yeah, we, we see the unemployment rate. Your, your situation is not uncommon. There are many communities where the unemployment rate is 20% now and higher. So uh, we do get it that big parts of the, some parts of the economy 
have a long way to go. And I think this is why the super majority of Americans actually support monthly 2000 checks that would lift and help millions out of poverty. Our immediate priority, as you all know, should be taking care of our American people struggling to make ends meet. The Federal Reserve's own monetary policy report shows that black and brown communities are overwhelmingly left behind during this economic recovery, Chairman. So what is the Federal Reserve doing specifically to address both the racial and social economic disparities that exist in the economic fallout from the COVID pandemic? Can you speak about that? Sure. So you know, with our monetary policy tools, they really lift the whole economy. But we, we made fundamental changes in our, in our monetary policy framework last year. Uh, and, and did so in part because of what we saw happening in low and moderate income minority communities with, in, at times of very low unemployment. So we've said that we won't tighten monetary policy just because of a very tight labor market. We'd want to see actual inflation or other issues that would potentially derail uh, the recovery. So that, I think, will in the long run be something that does benefit um, lower income people, communities of color. So specifically direct payments, is that what I'm hearing? No, really just that we will keep our rate, uh, our, our policy rate low uh, and, and encourage the economy to become very strong before we start tightening policy. And that's, that's what we've, uh, the guidance that we've given, by the way. Yeah. I don't know, for my, co for my residents at home, they want to be able to pay their rent, their water bill, utility. I'm not sure if that's going to work in black and brown communities, uh, Chairman. But last month, you know, over 100 leading economists urged Congress to pass a strong stimulus package, as you know, with comprehensive recovery from the pandemic. So I, I think we re need to look at some of these economists who are saying that direct uh, checks to individuals, um, like many other countries have done a number of times, and it's also very much tied into the unemployment rate. There are different kinds of triggers. I think we need you to take a lead in how we can really truly help um, address some of the racial and social economic disparities. Many of these communities, Chairman, were already in survival mode before. Uh, this pandemic and now are really truly suffering. And Chairman, Chairwoman Waters knows the stories in my district. I, I even mentioned one woman who said, you know, please Rashida, help me find another place to put my child in early childhood education program. I said, don't worry, I'll find you a different place. They can do it virtually. She goes, you don't understand. I need to be able to send her somewhere physically so that she can eat twice a day. So we need to understand the dire need on the ground. And Chairman, I know that you have to look at it more as a bigger picture. But understand your Federal Reserve own report says that you're failing and servicing, again, communities like mine, and we need to do more and be much more aggressive. Thank you so much, and I yield. Thank you very much, Ms. Tlaib. The gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Kustoff, is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Women, thank you for calling today's hearing along with the ranking member. Chair Powell, thank you very much for your leadership over this last year during tenure of your chairmanship, but especially the last year, because the economy really is performing much better than probably any of us would have thought a year ago at the onset of the pandemic. And your leadership is uh, is in large part a result of that. I do want to ask you, though, and, and I, I realize that we can all selectively pick out economic data, but on, on the heels of two things, one, the the retail sales numbers that came out last week that um, they were much stronger than I think anybody expected. And also, Chair Powell, with the with the CBO report that came out several weeks ago that predicted that the economy would grow by 4.6% in 2021 without any stimulus. So uh, before I hit you with the uh, with uh, the question that you won't answer, I am going to ask you: What are the what are the, some of the reasons that you think the economy has? Would you agree that the economy has performed better than we would have thought? Well, I just think, as a matter of fact, it has performed better. We, if you look at where generally private sector and our forecasts were in April or May of last year, what's happened is uh, the economy has recovered more quickly, generally, continually, and even as waves of COVID have happened. Uh, the economy has proven um, able to deal with those as the people have found ways to cope, businesses have found ways to cope. So we still, you know, we're still a long way from our goals, but we're, we're not living the, the, the downside cases that we were so concerned about in the first half of last year. And that's something to be very grateful for. 
so chair Powell, with, with with that with the with the cbo report with the with the economic data that that we've seen the fact that in the other stimulus packages that we passed last year we've got roughly one trillion dollars that hasn't uh, floated uh, gone into the economy that we've appropriated from a timing perspective, and I know in the, you've advocated to go big. From a timing perspective, uh, would we be better off, would we as a nation be better off waiting for some of that money to start circulating through the economy before approving another stimulus? That is a, an important question for people who are elected to deal with those issues. And it's really not something that you want your Federal Reserve, which says we have this independence, and I think the other side of it is stick to your job. And I, I think I, I just would defer to those of us who have stood for public election, which nobody elected us. So, all right, all right fair, fair enough. If I could, one thing I think everybody can agree on is the need to get our children back into into schools. And we we know the we know all the all the concerns that parents have, that uh, that students have, that teachers have that, that educators have. I do want to ask you though, has the has the Federal Reserve done any analysis on uh, on what school closures have done to employment in the United States? Or is there any data on that? Yeah, there's quite a lot of data on that. And uh, there's also research that people are doing that um, tries to quantify, very difficult to do this with confidence, but tries to quantify the burden that kids who miss a year of in-person schooling will bear through their economic lives and the effect that will have on the economy. So there's a lot of data and a lot of research. If you have something specific, we'll be happy to, uh, to find that for you. Well, and, and I, I was going to ask you about where you were just going a moment ago, but in terms of the school closures on parents, grandparents, family members, um, the fact that their, their children, relatives are at home, is that affecting employment in any way? school closures? Well, yes. I mean, in particular for women, um, if you're, many women have, uh, women's labor force participation dropped more and is still below that of men. The drop, the net drop went down and then moved back up, but the net drop is still larger than that for men. And that's because women have taken on more of the child care uh, uh, duties than men have in, in this time when school, kids are going to be at home. They're not going to be at school in, in, in many places. Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. And, and last, if I could, a China question. About a month ago, China released uh, some statistics that showed that their economy, in fact, grew, grew 2.3% last year in the face of a pandemic. Uh, very quickly, do you believe that data? I, you know, so I, it's always a good question. I don't have anything new to say on that. It just, it's, um, we don't have the kind of transparency into their data collection that we have for many of our other uh, nations, um, but you know, directionally, it's probably about right. We don't know how precise it is or how accurate it is in measuring economic activity, but it's probably better at me measuring the change than the level, if you know what I mean. Thank, thank you, Chair Powell. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Thank you all so very much. I'd like to thank our distinguished witness for his testimony here today. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to Chair Powell for his response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you're able. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. This hearing is adjourned.